we're going to start in a minute or so. So um, we have a sign-up sheet for the public hearings. Um, if you would be so kind. Mm, how about you? See if we can make it because it's next week, right? All right, we can start the meeting. Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the planning board meeting and happy Earth Day. Uh, in accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and broadcast over Lunenburg Public Access. Uh, three of us are here. Mr. Chenis is not with us. Um, and public comment. Is there any public comment? No, not related. I don't see anybody anyway. Um, okay, so we'll move on to our first agenda item is an ANR plan for 50 Page Street. Good evening. Good evening. So I'm here to request, I'm sure you have the documents there, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm here to request that we split the property at 50 Page Street. Um, we, we've done some engineering on it and it appears to meet all the regulations for the, the town. And I did go ahead and create images, if you'd like to see them, of what our plan is for the property. They've got lot width, and they've got acreage. And there's no existing house, so there's no issue with the uh, septic reserve area. They will still need to perk uh, if they haven't already prior to building, but uh, the issues that the Board of Health would generally raise for uh, lot divisions are only related with the existence Exist of a system. Right. Document that was just shown has a house. Where is that house? Oh, that's just superimposed. I just photoshopped he, he, he's that. He's showing what oh, is. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah. You're showing what you're proposing. Exactly what we're proposing. Okay. Yes, okay. correct. And your Photoshop abilities. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always easier. Picture tells a thousand words, so it's nice to see what we're, we're planning on building. So. And we don't have any review comments. No. We very seldom get review comments on, on an A&R plan. I was just looking at 53, and we do have comments. So oh. That's why I was okay. asking. An yeah. unusual case? Generally, in, unless somebody sends comments, we it, no news is good news as far okay. as comments. Well, 
So I would make a motion to approve the requested ANR. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please make sure you date it. Hmm? Make sure you date it, please. If you want to stick around, you can take the Mylar with you. Okay. Ooh. Nope, I lied. You can't. I don't have a recording form. 22. So if you swing by the office tomorrow, yes. we'll have okay. it for you. Perfect. Thanks very much. Our next item is an A&R for 53 Prospect Street. Need to finish signing that document and we'll be right, right with you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Steve Ballin from Whitman and Bingham. Uh, we prepared an A&R plan showing four lots, two of them front on Prospect Street and two on Cross Street. There's an existing lot on Prospect that is on municipal sewer that we created a lot around and then two additional lots. So I'm assuming that there's sewer on Prospect and not on Cross? Lot seven is shown on the plan would need a septic design. Lot eight and nine are within the municipal sewer district. Okay, so it's on cross and not prospect. It's on both. Is it right? Because of the service area boundary. Oh. The boundary on eight and nine. Yeah. Or cuts through eight and nine. Why is it not available on seven? Because it's outside of the area, the sewer service, sewer area. service area. The sewer service area is this line here. Right. So unless the house is within, the well, the house has the to the house be has to be within the service area for it to be considered sewered or sewerable. Okay. Hmm. And I believe there's a citizen petition on the town meeting to expand the service area to include lot seven. Okay. I'm, I'm looking at the information from the assessors. Um, you're aware that this is in chapter? Yes. Okay, so it would require a right of first refusal prior to selling any lots? Yes. And. <clears throat> uh, maybe the planning director can explain this. House lot 1.837 acres, chapter 61B, acreage is 12.76 acres. So is that the whole entire piece is the 12.76? Yes. Okay. So the well, entire parcel there, there's is an eighty thousand. There's an 80,000 square foot carve out okay. from chapter because you can't put house lot in chapter. Mm -hmm. So it's the same uh, on a farmstead. If you had 10 acres and you were in the RA zone, you'd only have nine acres within the chapter program because they're taxing single family homes at the standard single family home rate and the additional acreage is then taxed at the uh, additional rate. So you have 6.523, 2523, and 3839. Together, that equals out to the 12. Okay. Seven, five, or whatever the total is. 12.76. So the total lot size right now is the sum of the 1.83 right. and the 12.76. Well, correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Now, the fact that it's in chapter doesn't affect the A&R process. Correct. They can, they can do the A&R. It's all under single ownership. They can't convey any piece of it until the chapter is removed. Um, 
And I, I would have to look. They may be able to convey the home and retain the 12, the, the existing house, and retain the 12.76 because that's not in chapter. So there's no f first refusal on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the <clears throat> vacant lots would not be conveyable until the town has either discharged its rights, whether choosing to purchase it or saying they don't want to. So have you started the removal process from the town? The attorney for the client is in the okay. process of addressing okay. that. And the building official is requesting that the lot width be shown for lot six at the house. Okay. I, we did prepare, I have another mile out that shows the 175. Initially it wasn't put on there because the lines are perpendicular. So that 175 width maintains. Yeah, the copy we have shows the 175. That's the frontage. And right, but it doesn't look like the line changes. It doesn't. The building official wanted confirmation where there, where it's an existing house okay. as opposed to a vacant lot. Mm -hmm. For a vacant lot, if they don't put the 170, if it's not 175, they that's their own that. risk right. because they wouldn't be able to build, but they're creating a lot around an existing structure. And his concern was that they meet the 175 lot width. Um, they did communicate with us that they do have it, that they're perpendicular. Um, and as Mr. Ballard stated, he has a plan here this evening that, that shows that. If you want that mod to sign it with a churn, I can give you that mod. Right. The bearings confirm that they're perpendicular. That's what I was thinking. It looks to me like it's perpendicular. Well, I mean, mm, right. The bearings confirm that the side lot lines are parallel. That's proper English. Mm -hmm. I misspoke. <clears throat> So seven obviously is a reduced frontage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anything? Anything else? I'll make a motion that we approve the A and R as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And you guys wanted the amended mylar to sign? Yes. That paper copy to that? Yeah. I want to choose to meet all of them and sign them all. And if you swing by the office or Frank tomorrow, we can get you the, the paperwork to record it. Thank you. Can we sign all of them after the meeting? Oh, yeah. Okay. I guess if he's. Cool. <clears throat> all right. Moving on, number four on our agenda is tree work on scenic roads, a unitil. Hello, I'm John DiNapoli, the Municipal and Community Service Manager for Unitil. Uh, tonight I have with me is Sarah Sankowicz, our system arborist, and Dave Clapham, who's our forestry supervisor. So I'd like to have uh, Sarah come up and explain um, the SRP program that we're here uh, in front of you tonight for informational purposes. Please do. Thank you, John. Um, I am here today to talk about a proposed uh, tree um, program that we would like to implement in town. Um, so we have been in town before doing uh, tree work, which we call our regular vegetation management maintenance work, which includes pruning and tree removals um, through all of the lines that go through town. Um, and we are proposing to do um, a separate program to address reliability related issues in town. Um, so to give you a little bit of a background, um, over the last four years, uh, we've had poor reliability um, on one of the circuits that uh, serves the town. And the Department of Public Utilities um, has listed it as a poor performer and tasked us with um, doing some sort of activities to improve the performance of the circuit. Um, so over the last couple of years, it has not improved, which means we have a penalty um, coming up this year 
Um, so we are looking to improve performance. Uh, in looking at the cause of trouble and why we have reliability issues, the major driving factor are tree-related outages uh, on the main lines of the circuit. Um, so trees, uh, limbs, or whole entire trees uh, are breaking uh, and falling and contacting the lines, taking out a large number of customers. Uh, the circuit in question is the 30W30, and uh, it serves just shy of 1,400 customers in town. And um, so we do have a program that uh, was designed to address uh, reliability-related issues. It's called the Storm Resiliency Program. Uh, and we have done that program uh, for the last five years in other areas and had good luck with, with uh, improving reliability performance. So we are proposing to come into town and do that same program. Uh, we wanted to come and talk to you beforehand because it is an extensive amount of tree work. And so we wanted to get approval and talk about the, the process uh, before we did anything. So we are seeking uh, approval to go ahead with work planning. And then at that point, uh, we would talk to every individual customer that owns the trees and talk to the uh, town about all the specific trees. We can come back for a official hearing on those trees. Uh, but at this point, we wanted to talk about the program itself and whether or not it would even be something that uh, you would uh, consider having. So we do have a couple of uh, brochures about the program. What we're looking to do is ground to sky clearance, which means remove overhanging uh, branches. Uh, and as you can see in the graphic here, sort of the before and after uh, 10 feet to the side of the lines. Um, and we would be looking to remove uh, trees that are risky, that um, have some defects, whether structurally or biological defects, that would cause it to potentially come down in a storm event. Um, so that, that's what we would doing, be asking to do. And so the circuits that come through town, um, there would be a portion on Lancaster and then Lemister Road, so uh, scenic road areas. So we did want to... Uh, approach you about the project and uh, find out if we would be okay to proceed with um, work planning for the project. I'm sorry, did, did you say it was over a thousand homes? Yes, uh, a thousand, just shy of a thousand four hundred, a thousand three hundred something customers. That's it, about a quarter of the homes in Lunenburg. Pretty close. And those are the homes on that circuit, on not that circuit. necessarily the scenic road portions of that circuit. Correct. However, the scenic road persons are what we call critical sections. So if a tree were to fall down in a critical section, it could take out the entire circuit depending on where on the scenic road. Um, so the way that power flows from the substation out to the individual mm -hmm. homes, there are protection devices. So if it falls behind one of those, it would you know, open up and only a portion, you know, maybe 800 customers or 500 customers would be out. But if it falls closer to the substation, then it could take out everyone. Okay. Now, um, just uh, to cover all the bases, we have four scenic roads in town now. We, it was a couple of years ago that we put Northfield and Flat Hill into that. Yep, so we wouldn't be, um, Flat Hill is on the circuit, but it would not be considered a critical portion. Um, so we wouldn't be doing the ground to sky. We may be doing some hazard tree removal, but not the intensive hazard tree removal because uh, it doesn't serve the majority of the customers. Mr. Chairman. Obviously, my concern is ground to sky on a scenic road. Some of these trees are older trees. They're what makes it a scenic road. Um, and in the graphic you show, there is removal of one tree, um, but the other areas are pruned. So at what point would we know how many of the, of the trees within those scenic roads are going to be removed? Yep. So we have a work planner, which would be uh, David, who's also here with me. He's a certified arborist. He's um, trained in hazard tree. Um, identification. So he would personally take a look at all of those trees, do a 360 review, and he would assess them for defects. So we have a matrix um, that says whether or not a tree would be actionable based on where it's located and how many customers are served, uh, the probability that it would fall and strike the lines, and then the um, severity of the defect. So um, if it had a uh, failure of the root plate like you could see it uprooting and there was evidence of soil lifting that would be an immediate hazard we would definitely want to action on that um, if it just had a crown that uh, looked um, 
less opaque and less dense, then that might be something that we wouldn't have to remove, especially if it was leaning away or something like that. So we um, survey the trees for all of their defects, and then we'd make a decision whether or not they're actionable. And at that point, we would talk to the customers um, if they own the tree, if it's on private property, and ask if they would like it to be removed. Um, and then we would tag all of the trees with a color-coded um, piece of flagging tape that would uh, allow us to know which ones are coming down. And at that point, we could come back before the town um, and you would be able to see which, exactly which trees are gonna be coming down. Um, I will say that on this program, um, the tolerance for risk is lower than our regular program. So you will be we will be removing more trees per mile just on a general basis of having done it in the past. Uh, the numbers of trees that we remove per mile are higher because we assume less risk. We want to make sure that if a strong uh, you know, windstorm comes through that we're going to have less damage. What, what Dave would be doing and, and Sarah will do is, um, if we get approval, when Dave goes and gets the uh, approval of the customer, he'll put together a detailed package with a picture of the trees, so it'll be presented to you in advance to identify there are X number of trees that would be removed, and these are the ones that we would uh, not be removing, but we would be doing uh, maybe enhanced vegetation on it. So you'll see pictures of all of that in advance. And again, every one of these is going to be based upon the customer giving us permission in advance to do that. Yeah, so we would go through the normal uh, hearing process of marking the trees and then, um, you know, you can review them once they're marked. Uh, but we didn't want to go through all the trouble of work planning to do this work if it just wasn't going to be accepted in town. You know, if you just thought that this wasn't acceptable for your scenic roads, I, you know, I wouldn't want to make people unhappy by putting all the tags on the trees and all of that stuff. So we wanted to come and talk to you beforehand to see if this was even, you know, something that you would want to consider. Um, it, it has proven results to re improve reliability, but it does obviously remove a lot of trees and do some trimming. So, you know, some of the characteristics. So I guess you're looking for approval, but from my perspective, we can't approve what we don't know. Um, so from my <coughs> perspective, you know, certainly if you're affecting 1,400 people, and it has shown be, to be a poor performer and, and the circuit has to be addressed, it does make sense to look at it. But I'm not quite sure, that doesn't mean that I would approve removal of all of the trees. So certainly the planning component, I would, I would recommend that you go forward with, but mm -hmm. then come back and, and we can discuss exactly what that impact is on the scenic road, at least that's my perspective. Yeah, and other areas that we've done it, we've gone up to as many as 100 trees per mile marked to be removed. Obviously it depends the individual trees, what health, they are in but to give you the um, level of intensity we are looking at every single tree that is tall enough to have uh, potential to impact the power lines are you looking to remove any tree within that 10 feet radius we will look outside of that 10 foot radius we go on to private customers property obviously we'd have their permission to do it um, but if the tree is you know 60 feet tall we could go back you know, 50 or so feet, as long as it has the potential to hit the power but, lines. But within that 10 foot radius mm -hmm. from the roadway, well, actually from the power line, are you looking to remove ground to sky? You're looking to remove those trees or would you consider pruning in that 10 foot radius? We would consider pruning in that 10 foot radius. It depends how much pruning has to be done. So um, if it has a significant crown that's above 15 feet, we normally tr trim 15 feet above the power line. Um, so if there's a significant crown uh, above 15 feet, you know, maybe 20 to 25 feet above that zone, um, and we have to remove more than a quarter of the tree's crown, then we would rather remove the tree because the tree would be um, adversely affected, you know, health-wise if we're removing a large portion of the crown. So in some instances where the trunk of the tree is close to the power lines, we would be looking to remove. But in all instances where the tree is healthy, uh, we would definitely be looking to prune the tree rather than just remove it. So that average you talked about, the 100 trees, have you looked at the areas that you'd be cutting? I mean, are we, are, we, are we looking at that kind of impact? We are. We are. Yeah, we're looking at, in some areas, it's, it's heavy. We've um, looked at the trees, and just from a windshield survey, um, we noticed many defects. Some of them have some previous storm damage in the crown um, or, um, you know, growth defects from over time. Well, 
we did one site walk since I've been on the board for the solar. I personally, I'd like to take a look at these areas and get an idea of what we're talking about. Um, I don't know how the rest of the board feels. I think we should probably schedule a bus trip or something, right? Rather than walking. Yeah, um, and, and the other thing that comes to my mind is how does this work in terms of what's within the scenic road area versus private property and where is the boundary line like some of these trees they would theoretically need permission from the property owner and the planning board the scenic road only covers trees within the right of way okay. so if the tree is off of the town's right of way it's not part of the scenic okay. road it's private property it's a negotiation directly with the property owner <clears throat> excuse me so it's either one or the other so if they correct get, if they're in a situation where they don't know exactly where the line is and they get permission from both they're covered correct i mean and they could also survey locate where you know where the tree is in relation to the roadway um have you done the storm resiliency program in a community on a community scenic road previously uh not on a scenic road okay would there be mitigation to restore some of the character of scenic roads so if a private individual came in and said we and when we had this uh, somewhat recently um, we had a, a, a couple who was building a modular home and they needed to clear a large triangle to be able to swing the large truck in and they took down something like 30 trees within the the right-of-way because of the way the street lined up and they proposed a plan to replant that area to over time recreate that scenic road is that something that unitil would consider as part of their planning efforts something that might work to recreate that that tree lined look that facilitated the town deciding to to put scenic road status on it and i you know i know you probably can't give us a a firm answer now I, I understand how it works but I, I think that might be something that uh, the board may find more comfort in because if you take away 100 trees per mile and you put back 70 that you know you can place in a way that are going to grow and, and have minimal effect on the lines but still leave that that old scenic feeling then there might be some push and pull that that would get everyone to a point that this is something that could be successful yeah, I mean, we could definitely talk about replanting the right type of trees back in that space, but I'm not sure it would give you that same feeling. You know, we would be looking at lower growing species mm -hmm. that wouldn't, you know, come in contact with the power lines. If we were going to be doing larger um, tree species, we would want them set back on customers' property, not within the town right away. So we do have a replacement tree program. Um, it's not quite to the level that, you know, you were talking about mm -hmm. if, if we take down um, 100 trees we're not replacing 90 trees um, but we do um, offer trees to people who have uh, multiple trees coming down on their property so if they're taking down 10 or 15 trees we might offer two or three trees or depending on the site you know if they were large trees it varies a little bit um, and we do offer them large trees that they can place on their property and we have a tool that helps them to decide where on their property to put it to help with energy savings for their house um, and it also shows, you know, the road and those areas. So we would um, dissuade people from planting large trees right back in the same zone where they mm -hmm. would become a problem again. <coughs> um, so I guess, you know, we could talk about what characters we would look, uh, characteristics mm -hmm. we would like to get back with the loss of uh, those trees and which ones would be something that the utility would support. And we could talk about uh, plans to, um, you know, give away trees that would fit with the criteria so they both can coexist, that would be fine. Then through the chair again, you talked about putting larger trees on customer property, which again makes sense from, from your perspective. And I've seen in communities where um, street trees will be planted on private property uh, and the private property owner will work out an easement so that those trees are controlled either by the town or by someone else to prevent you know someone from saying, oh, well, I know we're on a scenic road, but..." trees on our property so we can kind of cut it down if that replacement were negotiated and that kind of thing is that something that and, and again I, I pose this to the board I pose this to you understanding that 
there's a, a high chain of command and you have all the, the stuff that you have to go through, but is that something you might consider working with the town to sort out as some sort of ownership or, or lack of clearance easement to allow for these trees to continue to grow and, and maybe replace the, the large, you know, hundred year old trees that are, are now needing to be removed? Yeah, I mean, we can offer any assistance to the town uh, as far as working on a town-wide tree replacement program and ownership and looking at budget to care for those trees. Um, when we give replacements to homeowners, we try to empower them to be able to take care of them themselves, mm -hmm. talk about what a tree needs. Uh, we uh, give out information on tree planting. We offer information on choosing the right tree at a nursery if they wanted to go forward with adding additional trees. Um, when they come and get their tree for replanting, we offer free advice, um, you know, about the trees on their property or answer any questions that they might have. Um, and we encourage them to set aside a budget to have an arborist, you know, look at and care for their tree. Um, so, you know, promoting stewardship um, of the trees through your community, whether they're on private or public, is always a great uh, choice and we would be willing to help out with any program that you might come up with for that and help develop <laughs> one and if you would like to uh, plant some trees on town property and want to have some assistance creating a budget and a process for for uh, caring for those trees we would wholeheartedly help with that process thank you well <clears throat> i don't know how many s service providers there are located on the, on these poles probably multiple um, well, while we're asking for considerations, um, I think you could probably get you could probably put the power underground and sit and have need a lot less width than 20 feet. Yep, putting um, power underground is an option in some select areas. It is very expensive, and um, you know, being in a rocky area and converting from overhead to underground is definitely has its own challenges. Uh, but that is an option where we, you know, select places where it's right. Uh, we do consider that. Okay. Um, it is very expensive. It's more expensive than doing this. Uh, so we always are trying to look at costs and make sure that for our rate payers, you know, we um, are weighing the cost versus the benefits. Um, if there is an outage in an underground area, they are very um, costly and time consuming to uh, replace. So that is a drawback to an underground uh, situation and they do still have tree impact because you'll be um, digging or roots. tunneling and, and roots so it's it's not a complete clean situation but in in appropriate areas um, that's a consideration um, so if that's something you know you would like us to look at in more detail for a cost for some of these areas to be put them under underground I can certainly talk with our engineering uh, and operations department and find out you know for specific areas how much that would cost so you did say you looked at this area and you have an idea that we are talking about a big impact. Do you have any kind of map or any kind of information that you can share showing where the really high impact areas are going to be? So that if we do take a site visit or can you join us on a site visit absolutely. to show us where that, that impact is going yeah, to be? Yeah, we can absolutely uh, join you on a site or we can mark up a map um, you know, that can be provided as to you know, where we think a lot of the impact would be. Like a market map and then site visit to the most impacted area? I, I think that makes sense. Does that sure. sound good? Yeah. So I'll work with Unitil to set something up that in the next. Great. That would be I, mean, I don't know what your time frame is to, to kind of start planning and, and move this forward. Yep, we would like to start work planning on it uh, in the near future. Work planning takes a number of months to talk to all the homeowners, and we do a lot of education and outreach while we do it. Um, to make sure everyone's comfortable with what's happening. Um, and then obviously we come back for the hearing on the individual trees and we would like the work to be done by the end of the year. Uh, so that's the full time frame. Usually we start cutting uh, in September through the end of the year. So if we looked at something in early May for a site walk, that yes. would, okay. Now a question for you would be, um, if there's gonna be a public hearing on it, would the, a butter notification be required? Well, it would be, it would be, it would follow the scenic road. Uh, and I don't think that we notify a butters. There's a notice placed and there's an advertisement placed and there's usually a big conspicuous thing nailed to the tree. Okay. Um, and all of the butters are, are clearly going to have been informed in, in some way, shape or form through uh, all the people in green vests True. climbing True. around trees Good for point. a couple of months. Good point. Yep. Well, maybe it would be beneficial to have a date pick so when they communicate with the customers, 
customers can be made aware mm -hmm. of what that date is. Yeah, I, I think let's um, let's do the site walk and see if the board is is interested in in working with them to move forward, and then we can kind of negotiate when we think it, it would be reasonable. I mean, if they want to start cutting in September, I, I would probably suggest our first meeting in September um, without any other information, just because that last meeting in August is always really dicey as far as who's around and everyone getting ready for school and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, our first meeting in, in September is usually just after school started, so everybody's here and ready to go, and um, there's not a lot of other stuff happening. Would that give you enough time? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, but starting uh, with a hearing for, so we could have the hearing in September, start cutting in mid-September. Is that enough time? Yeah, and I mean we can we can Early talk August. about it as we as we get into okay. it. Yeah, I think the first step is to do mark up the map and do the site walk, and then we can go from there. Yeah, depending on how much you know we're cutting, obviously, it, you know, it takes longer or it can and be shorter. Just for clarification, you mentioned that you haven't done this ground to sky program in scenic roads. Have you done it on any roads in town? Uh, we mm -hmm. have not done it on any roads in town. Um, I, I thought you did it on Reservoir Road. I started this program in 2011, so there was uh, another. Uh, operations group that did a reliability program uh, on reservoir, but it is not this program that was managed um, separate of this. But it was ground to sky clearing, correct? From my recollection, I I, I was on the board at the time, and I think I it was ground so. ground to sky clearing on Reservoir Road. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't not involved with the planning on that one, but I I know they did a reliability project and. Um, yeah. Have you done one locally? Uh, we've done it in Townsend last year, so um, Main Street in Townsend, and then the year before that was uh, going west uh, towards Ashby. We did it in uh, Townsend and Ashby. So in Townsend, was it 119 from Townsend Harbor? Ooh. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> from where? And where it pops out in Townsend Harbor yeah. at Shepherd's so that was Take a, a Right. Okay. A little bit more aggressive than we normally do. In some areas, landowners require that we take more out in order to get approval for some of the other ones so and then what's the status of your normal operations in these areas like have these already been pruned like you're pretty much up to date or yeah we're on a five-year cycle so we are still uh, all set on the five-year cycle and that operates independently of this program so if this program were to not happen we would still come back and do our regular pruning which does the window around the wires and uh, we do have us spot um, that will come up for pruning this year, uh, which we just didn't want to muddy the waters at this point about this program. But then the circuit, uh, you know, the rest of the lines that are not under this storm resiliency program will undergo uh, the regular pruning after that. And that regular pruning hasn't had a positive impact on reliability? Um, it, it has. I mean, we've um, improved reliability in um, the nine years since I've, you know, been here. Uh, but as far as impact from storms and major events, um, this is really targeted to, for that, and it has a larger impact. Um, we've seen an increase in the severity and frequency of large damaging storms, so that's why we uh, started this storm resiliency program. Right. Um, Cameron, I don't know if you want to... Um, Sure, I don't see why not. Steve Weaver, 288 Holman Street. I'm well aware of the towns in 119, but um, also um, I just want to caution the board um, that so that the town um, for uh, um, runoff after all of this is cleared out if it runs off onto the roads then it could create a problem for the town to be liable for it um, so i wanted to make somebody aware that um, that should be part of the uh, uh, thing also because we had some trees removed from holman street 
and that's a mess down there with uh, runoff going down the street. And um, so uh, I just want to caution the board to be aware of that for storm uh, water, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Since work on a scenic road requires the planning board and DPW oversight uh, director, it might make sense to let Jack know when we're doing the site visit mm -hmm. and invite him to attend and, and talk specifically about that concern at, at the follow-up meeting. No, that's because Jack is the tree warden? Correct. Okay. Yeah, we did um, speak with Jack already about the program and let him know we were coming here, so he is aware that we are planning something, so it would be great to have him join. Very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, all right. Do we have the uh, the hearing uh, announcement? Oh, here it is. Yes, it should okay. be right in your folder. Um, all right. Ken's not here, so I'll go ahead and read it. Um, so next, we've got public hearing on the zoning warrant articles. The town of Lunenburg. Public hearing. The Lunenburg Planning Board will hold a public hearing on April 22nd, 2019, 6.35 p.m. Joseph Blotta Meeting Room, Town Hall, 17 Main Street, Lunenburg, Mass., 01462, to make alterations to the Code of Lunenburg, Mass., Chapter 250 Zoning, I, Article V, 5.6.4.13, oh, I'm sorry, 5.6 Cluster Development by adding a new subsection F to by citizen petition, Article 4, citizen petition, Article 4, 4.1, permitted and prohibited uses, 4.1J, recreation uses to prohibited uses, 4.1G, use table to add the corresponding use, and 5, by citizen petition to amend the zoning map by rezoning portions of land located at 131 map 146 parcel 0003 133 map 146 parcel 0004 151 map 146 parcel 0027 and 181 map 146 parcel 0008 lemonster shirley road copies are on file in the planning office 960 mass ave lunenburg mass Okay. So this is, yeah, no, go ahead and proceed as, so you, as you. I would say either do the zoning map or the uh, events first. Do the zoning map? Okay. You can use the easel that's already set up, Brian. Which one are we doing first? Z zoning map. This is 131133. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I'm going to leave it here. That's fine. Uh, wherever. You, you can. If you put it up here, they can see it on the TV. If you put it up here next to you, they can see it on the TV in the audience. Because they'll turn it so that if he turns it this way, they'll put the camera on it, and then there's a TV in the corner if anyone's interested. He's directing us. He's oh, angle. Directing us. Angle. Oh, sorry. You have to angle it. Because he's going to use this one. Okay. <clears throat> so, my name is Brian Marchetti with McCarty Engineering. I'm here tonight on behalf of Powell Stone and Gravel um, for a request for a zoning map amendment for their parcels located at 131 through 181 Lemus Shirley Road. Um, the part, the Powell Stone and Gravel now occupies uh, these several parcels that are all located next to each other. Uh, it's about 60 acres in total um, in common ownership. And sections of the property 
currently have zone lines that don't follow the property lines. They bisect several of them. Um, so for instance, here at 131, Lemons Shirley Road, there's a little um, point three acre parcel on the back side here, or not parcel, but a piece of the property that's in the resident zone. Um, so we're requesting this entire lot to be in the commercial zoning district. Can you just take the microphone so yep. that people Sorry. are home? <laughs> so pointing this specific piece of this parcel, it's part of 131 Lemister Shirley Road, uh, but a small portion of it's in the residence zoning district, uh, the residence B. So we're requesting for this specific parcel, if we could amend the zoning map just to include the rest of that piece in the commercial zone, uh, commercial zone. Same thing with this front portion here of 133 Lemons Shirley Road, uh, requesting this zone line be amended so that the entire lot is within the commercial zoning district. Here on 151 Lemons Shirley Road, uh, there's a section of it that's commercial, but the remaining is in the uh, office park and industrial district. So. We like the zone line to follow the property line as it stands. And as well on the 181 Lemister Shirley Road property, which is right here, the northern portion of that lot, there's about 6.8 acres uh, that's within the residence B zoning district. And we're requesting that the entire parcel be located within the office park and industrial district or zone. Um, there has been history on this lot back when Padula's brothers owned it. There was a portion of this property was in the residence district and I believe it was oh eight ish plus or minus. Same request was made at town meeting and the, the property was um a portion of the property was rezoned to the commercial. So modification of this type does not constitute uh spot zoning. It's all within the current lot that it stands. Um and in doing so Palestone and Gravel will be able to operate the full property with as an allowed use within the full limits of their acreage on this this site um, so we submitted this plan back in january um, we're hoping to have you know the town department of planning board review it um, and provide us support so when we come to town meeting in a couple of weeks uh, it makes the process that much easier so through the chair just to sort of simplify what you said you have four parcels yes and at the end of this, two would be commercial, two would be office park industrial. Yes. And you would just be shifting the zoning districts to meet the meets and bounds of the parcel. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And this is something that we had, had suggested that they do when they'd come before us earlier. Um, They've done a nice job neatening up our zoning for us. <laughs> exactly. We'll try. Yeah. One small piece at a time. Yep. And Mr. McCarty is correct. This is not spot zoning. Um, the zone already exists. You're taking land that is dual zoned and, and I, I'll say correcting the defect. Uh, it, it benefits the town in as much as it benefits any individual property owner. Uh, and generally spot zoning is something where you take a parcel of land and zone it only to the benefit of the property owner. I think it's important to note here too that all of the property that surrounds the area we're modifying is pretty much zoned the same. We have the MBTA rail uh, as one abutter. Uh, the other abutter here is the North Lemus Rod and Gun Club, which is in the residence B, um, but it's, it's not really residential use. And then Keating's right. on the other side as well. It looks good to me, it makes sense. I, I think it makes sense. Yeah. We do have to entertain public comment, right? Mm -hmm. Is anybody would like to speak to this article? Anyone at all? No? No, typically we make a recommendation at town meeting. You can make your, you, I would, after you close the hearing, vote on each okay. individual article tonight and they'll ask what your recommendation is at town meeting. Okay. Uh, but I find it easier for the board to have made a determination prior unless they're 
we have one article later where the proponent was unable to be here. Mm -hmm. so, uh, we'll have to hear so I, I would suggest the board may want to continue the hearing and see if he's available or uh, defer and listen to the, the petition at town meeting. Okay. Anything else? No, that's it. Mm, anything else from the board? No? I would make a motion to close the public hearing. Well, you, it's, yeah, that's right. To close this specific This, one. yeah, the, the public hearing for this article. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Is it appropriate to make a recommendation now? Or do you want yeah, to that's fine. Yeah. Okay, if you're going to close individual hearings, you can do that. Sure. I would make a motion to recommend approval of this article at town meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Super. Um, so now why don't we go to the, um, the event thing, because it's probably what most people are here for, actually. Mm -hmm. So now we'll be doing the, uh, the citizens, citizens petition for the event permitting, licensing? No, it's for the exhibition and workshop. Exhibition and workshop. It's a new use and new codification use. of the use. Okay. I stand corrected. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Robert Bowen, 1686 Mass Ave, but tonight I'm here on behalf of Darren Massey, 300 Holman Street. Uh, I'm, here I'm here tonight on behalf of Dr. Massey, uh, 300 Holman Street. Better? Great. Uh, uh, Dr. Massey regrets that his schedule did not permit him to be here in person tonight, but uh, I wanted to take a minute to explain uh, why we got here and then to address the the article that is being proposed uh, Dr. Massey has been waiting uh, patiently for the Board of Selectmen to develop their uh, special event licensing uh, which is still an ongoing conversation that they're having uh, but recently Dr. Massey was admon admonished by the building commissioner uh, in writing and then again at the Board of Selectmen's meeting where we attended seeking entertainment licenses uh, that he should pursue a discussion of a change of use with this board. Uh, and so that's why we're here. Um, I drafted this article. Uh, it's not intended to sort of be an end run around the board. It's intended to be a placeholder so we can have a conversation, a conversation that the land use director and the building commissioner have continually urged Dr. Massey to have. Uh, so I'm here to answer any questions you have about the proposal. Uh, hopefully, if this is the direction that the board wants to go in, we can present a comprehensive proposal that may be amended uh, before it's discussed at town meeting so that we can all present a unified front. Uh, there are uh, two sections. One, I've added a definition, uh, and that's for exhibitions and workshops. The second piece of it is I've added to the use table a corresponding location for that new definition. Uh, but it's basically got three moving parts. What, where, and how. The what is the special event. Uh, I'm, I'm not committed to any particular language. I was trying to be inclusive and imagine all the different types of events that I could think of that might fit with this type of thing. If the board thinks it's too broad or too narrow, we're certainly receptive to hearing what the board has to say. Uh, the where, I've drafted it to apply to all zones. Uh, Dr. Massey's property is not the only property that's affected by this. There are other large parcels in town that are zoned either residence A or outlying. There may be other properties in other districts too that are affected uh, so I drafted it very broadly to include all zones 
Uh, I think, frankly, this issue is most likely to arise in the residential and outlying zones. I, I think in the commercial districts where uh, there already may be similar ongoing uses, uh, the issues that have arisen recently in the outlying area are less likely to occur. So if the board were to suggest that it's overbroad and would like to limit it to uh, residential and outlying use, or even if they want to try it out in the outlying, I, I couldn't argue with any of that. Uh, but I've, as a starting point, I've drafted it very broadly. Uh, and then the last piece is the how. Uh, it's, it's challenging because zoning and licensing, although obviously there's some overlap in relation, are two different things. And the zoning board and this board, the land use boards are looking at one set of criteria when they're assessing zoning. The board of selectmen is addressing a totally different criteria when it comes to licensing. So I, I was attempting to try to reconcile these two things by making still the board of selectmen in their capacity as the licensing authority the oversight body for this new provision. Uh, my reference is to the existing entertainment licenses that are granted by the Board of Selectmen. If there was to be adopted the special event licensing policy or the special event licensing bylaw, which has also been proposed, that reference could be changed to include the, the special event licensing. Uh, I'm weary of just more generally saying licensing, because there are other licenses that the Board of Selectmen issue that I haven't even thought about how this might affect, so I'm trying to limit it to either the event permitting or the entertainment license, but earth removal permits, liquor licenses, junk licenses, used car, I haven't even thought about how that might interplay with this. So I don't want to just say licensing, uh, but I do think that the decision making belongs with the Board of Selectmen, uh, and I'm anxious to hear uh, what the Board thinks about the whole concept of the new use, because that's what Dr. Massey has been asked to talk to you about. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to clarify something that you yes. mentioned here. It, it sounded like it contradicted something that had come up before, that, that licensing and zoning, my understanding is there is no overlap. They're separate. They're, they're, they're completely separate, okay. but I think what we're attempting to do here is to, to bridge that gap. And I think I've, I've tried to do it in a couple of different ways in my draft of the special event permitting process, I've tied it in by saying that any permits issued in excess of, and pick a number, I think the Board of Selectmen has four, my draft has six, but any permits issued in excess of whatever that number is can only be granted with reference to the underlying zoning. Uh, so that's that's really the challenge here is we're we're trying to straddle two sets of criteria uh, and this is my attempt at how to do that but i'm i'm certainly open to suggestions right. any any other questions that you have about the, the draft or anything else i'm not sure we'll, we will find out all right thanks thank you what do we have to say I don't know if there's some public comment. First, do we want to have a discussion? Or do we want to have the public weigh in first? They're from the public. Okay. okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just for clarification, is this related to both Articles 40 and 41, or are we taking them? I'm not real sure. Uh, I don't have my warrant with me. The event permitting article is, is 41. That is a general bylaw. There is no public hearing required per Mass General Law. So in filling the statutory requirements under 40A, 
We are holding a public hearing prior to town meeting in reference to Article 40 only. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, sounds like we'll take public comment. Please. Good evening, uh, John Dombrowski. I'm an attorney in Lemonster. Uh, I was asked to come tonight to speak um, on behalf of some homeowners in Lunenburg. Um, and uh, the reason they're asking uh, me to speak is because they're, they're afraid. Um, they're afraid that this particular uh, proposal is too all-encompassing um, and is going to affect and compromise their primary assets, which are their homes. Um, what this proposed warrant article is doing is essentially trying to circumvent zoning. Um, and I would respectfully disagree that zoning and licensing are two different issues. I would respectfully disagree with that. Um, simply put, uh, a license granting authority in Lunenburg, obviously the Board of Selectmen, cannot issue a license for a use that is not per permitted in, in a zone. Just can't do it. You, you can't issue a license for a gas station in a residential zone. You can't issue a license for a restaurant in a residential zone. And similarly, you cannot issue a license, an entertainment license, if that use is not permitted in a residential zone. Um, and I know uh, you heard from prior counsel who voiced his opinion. Um, I'm, I'm fairly confident in my research, uh, and I would say that, well, there's an old saying that one lawyer in a small town will starve to death, but two can make a pretty good living. And I would, uh, you know, I would urge this board, and I would urge the town of Lunenburg to get some objective independent advice from, from town council. Um, because it simply just doesn't make any sense. Um, this article is purporting to be a town-wide article, um, but the history of this particular issue um, strongly suggests that it's being proposed to benefit one property owner, and it's going to significantly detriment um, a couple of very specific neighborhoods. And, and we're talking about Holman Street, we're talking about Windmere Drive, we're talking about that area. Um, but just in closing, um, the building inspector issued a cease and desist on this very particular issue for essentially the same reasons that I've set forth um, to this board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, to respond to that, you really, I mean, they, that they don't grant licenses for uses, right, exactly. So that's what zoning is for. And a gas station and what was the other example, a bank? Those are permanent. These are, these are like events. So, um, and, and this is an attempt, I believe, to have it be a use. Other comments? Yeah, anybody else, please? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Mr. Bernie, my name is Chris Borelli from 484 Holman Street. Um, I'll focus my uh, comments just on Article 40. Um, my read of it is that it's much too broad, similar to how Mr. Bowen has sort of portrayed that. You have to look at Article 40 as if Article 41 doesn't get approved, so it has to stand on its own. So there's nothing in Article 40 that says there's a maximum number of attendees. So you could have a workshop or an exhibit with 50, 100, 1,000. You could argue 10,000 people. 
And as long as the Board of Selectmen issues that license, that, that's what we would have in a residential area. And that, that's a problem for me personally, and I think many of the uh, neighbors that are here tonight. Um, the second thing is it doesn't talk to, again, assuming that Article 41 is not approved, and Article 40 have to, has to stand on its own, there's no limit on the frequency. So you could, if Article 40 is approved, anybody in town could request a license for a workshop or an exhibit every single weekend. And the board would have their hand, the board of selectmen would have their hands tied because Article 40 would have been passed. So I'd strongly encourage you to work to somehow amend this to put some boundaries on it. It's just far too broad. So thank you. Thank you. Public comment? Anyone else? Please. Uh, Steve uh, Whitman, 473 Holman Street. I'm a director of Butter, and I've lived there for 40 years. Uh, I built my house there back in 79. I think the board uh, really has to look at this for what it is. Okay, we have a homeowner who bought a piece of land thinking that he was going to be able to operate a business out of it. Come to find out, the zoning does not put him, put him permit him to do it. He went to the ZBA to try and get a special permit to do so. He was essentially turned down by the board because the abutters turned out in force for many reasons. Um, Holman Street, as an example, in front of my house, okay, is only 14 feet wide, the pavement. The town subdivision control law requires streets at least 22 feet wide. And there's a good reason for that, and that's for safety. Sidewalks, drainage, sight distance. Uh, going back a few years, my grandfather owned all the property at the corner of Route 13 and Holman Street on both sides. I approached the town myself, where Windermere is located today, to change that zoning from outlying, uh, from, uh, outlying to commercial because it made sense at the time. There was commercial across the street, there was commercial down the street. Unfortunately, it was turned down at town meeting. Fine, it was developed residential. Now we go on to Holman Street, okay, coming off Route 13. My grandfather owned that property across the street as well, some 50 some odd acres. We had proposed to put a single street in, a cul-de-sac, with homes. At that time, Marion Benson, who was the chairman of the planning board, instructed us that she wanted to detail the traffic study and many other things, which prohibited the project because of the cost. It was for the amount of money that was going to come out of it to my parents, okay, it didn't prove viable. So we were forced to go with an ANR process, approval not required very simply using the frontage and carving it up into several lots. What that did was created even more driveway cuts, which affects the traffic. With a narrow street, no sidewalks, the kids play in the street, you can understand the problems. So lo and behold, this was why the ZBA turned the person down. Now, as far as I'm concerned, it is not our fault, the people who live on the street, that we bought a home or built a home in a residential zone, that someone buys a big piece of property and discovers he can't do a business on it and then tries to go through the town to be able to do it. We own a home in a residential zone because we like our way of life. We don't want additional traffic, we don't want the noise, and we don't want people camping in the woods and it just goes on and on and on. That's why we have spoke many times against this. I have outlined in several letters about the engineering deficiencies of the road, sight distance, uh, horizontal and vertical alignments. I mean, I can go on and on and speak about Holman Street. In fact, the bridge was even closed at, you know, 
uh, years ago because it was substandard. As well as on the other side of the bridge, it's substandard. There's no drainage and there's, there's a lot of additional problems. So for the homeowner then to say, okay, well, I can't operate my business, I want to change the zoning. Well, that violates our rights. We invested our money in our property, thinking it was going to stay residential and be protected under those rights. It wasn't meant or to go on to say, okay, now we're going to change the zoning and let a guy operate a business. It's not right. And I think the board really has to consider what they're doing here if they recommend approval on this. The attorney says, well, this is not spot zoning or this is for town-wide. Well, in essence, it's not. Because as he even said, that this activity is allowed in commercial and industrial zones, possibly. It's only a problem in outlying and residential districts. Well, there's a reason for that, because the commercial and industrial districts allow it, because that's the purpose of this type of zoning. The residential and outlying do not. And that's the reason, because people want to protect the way, the, their way of life. So I think the board better consider heavily before they go ahead and recommend approval on something like this, because you're opening the door, okay? And there's a lot of court history on this. About abutters standing up and speaking against something like this, and the town approving it, and the town being taken to court. Because the abutters have a say. The courts have protected the citizens' rights. Because as I said, they bought their property, invested their good money, and it's something they thought they had protection on. And by doing this, you're circumventing that right. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Any further public comment? Please. My name is Nate Wallach. I live at Six Windermere. I'm in a butter. Um, this is my first planning committee. Okay, first time down here. I'd never, I didn't realize that you guys even got together on Mondays. You know, I'm sorry that the good doctor couldn't be down here tonight to join us, okay? But, uh, I, you know, we don't like coming down here to fight this, okay? I've had to come many, many times down here just to attend. You know, we, I came down here today because of, uh, you know, what I think is uh, fair and reasonable. And I think that's what I want, okay? I come down here to town hall to find something that's fair and reasonable. And I think that's what everybody wants. Um, I don't know, I've heard Mr. Uh, Allison here has some kind of relation to the end user, all right? That our friend, the doctor and you are pretty tight. Is that accurate? Do you know this guy? Do you I have do any relation this. with this person? I think everybody in town knows him okay. by now. Okay, why, why do you weigh in on this? How is that fair and reasonable, sir? Okay, if you're, if you're pretty tight with this guy, I don't understand how you can make a fair assessment here and be part of this judgment. And that's what I want here today. Okay, is I want something that's fair and reasonable. All right, I don't think, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people came down here today to stand out in front of this board and none of them showed up with representation. Okay, nobody goes in front of the board of selectmen with representation that I've seen, okay? And, uh, you know, as a result, uh, we have to come down here now and hire a lawyer to try to defend our houses and our homes, okay? This is, uh, you know, what I think is uh, unreasonable, okay? Our neighborhood um, opposes commercial use of our backyard, okay? And that's what's going on here. He's trying to manipulate this to be done. Okay, he's got, tried to get himself elected to boards and committees. Okay, this is, this is absolutely unreasonable. And uh, you know, to put the doctor's agenda and commercial interests above the neighborhood is not fair and reasonable. So I mean, I'm, I'm here to oppose the fix. 
Okay, the neighborhood is here and armed with representation. I can't imagine that you have, you know, Unitil and, and Powell were here. Nobody came and opposed those guys. Nobody showed up with lawyers to give those guys a hard time tonight, did they? We, we, wanted, we want this taken care of. And uh, we, don't want to, uh, we don't want the laws ch changed to serve the few instead of the many. And the neighborhood should be able to stand up for itself. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair? Yes. I do just want to make a clarification. Um, and I, I hope everybody understands it. And if not, I want to make sure everybody does. This is a petition that was submitted through signature by a, a citizen of the town. So this is, is citizen generated, which is anybody's right through the town meeting process. This hearing here does not approve or deny this process. The planning board's making a recommendation to town meeting. So on May 4th at town meeting, this will be taken up on the floor and that would be when a decision is made to approve or not approve. Um, and I, I appreciate that the neighborhood has come out and is, is willing to, to voice their concerns, but I also, this isn't the, the end of, of any of this. This is, this is a statutory requirement that the planning board hold the public hearing as they are sort of the arbiters of zoning proposals to town meeting uh, and there will be a debate on the floor uh, as well thank you for just a matter of process thank you for the clarification public comment please uh, good evening my name is Derek Matson. I live at 4 Windermere Drive and listening to everything tonight, I just want the board uh, to, to really think about this again, not to reiterate or to be redundant to what other people have said, but to really think about the intent of this article. It's being proposed as sort of a, a, a town-wide article that will apply to all zoning districts. But I'd like to remind everybody, I think it really relates to one specific property and not all the districts in town. I think we know it's all about one specific property and the interests of that property owner. It's kind of broad to say it would apply to all districts uh, throughout town and other large parcels of land. I would, I would wonder if those other large parcels of land are on board with this or opposed to it. And it also kind of brings up the question, if there's one parcel of land here that we're talking about that's pro for this, and there's maybe 10, 20, 25, abutters and neighborhood owners that are against it if this were to go town-wide to other large properties um, maybe those 10 15 20 uh, abutters there would also have serious concerns and then you're not talking about just a few dozen people you could be talking about several hundred people who are really not too excited about uh, this amendment in in the zoning bylaws change. So there's numerous people against this tonight, and I think if a lot of people were educated, there'd be a, a big potential for a lot more people to be against this. And I just want you guys to keep that into consideration for us, please. Uh, we have made big investments. We knew the zoning when we came in and chose our property. We expected that to, to stay and you to help protect our investments. And uh, we ask that you consider that uh, when considering this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more public comment? Yes, please. Hi, Steve Weaver, 288 Holman Street. Um, there's been an awful lot of talk about um, 300 Holman and, and the legacy of it. And the, um, the Lane family they were very, very private people. Nobody ever went to their house. <laughs> they, they were secluded. And if they went looking for art somewhere or, or doing something or had one person stay over, that's all it was. It wasn't anything to do with events or anything like that. Because like I said, they were very, very private people. And some people, uh, I mean, they wouldn't even invite people over to their house. So to say that this is a legacy, it's not. And those who like history should understand that. And 
they should understand also that what everybody else said tonight about it being a residential area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment? Anyone else? Nope. All right. I actually have a question on one section of the article, if I could. There's a sentence that says, any outdoor or indoor farming. What specifically is it? Is that meant to mean? I was that raises a concern. I, let me just farming look at the, of what? I mean, it was it again. It was intended to encompass events. So I was thinking of farming events, like if it was a grange event or or some kind of. Affair. I'm not. I'm not intending to convey actual farming uh, so, so I do so. have a concern with that sentence because it, when, when you read further it talks about topics included but not limited to farming health nature or art but I'm concerned about that language any outdoor or indoor farming um, is that supposed to be modified by the word performance or exhibition correct it's a farming f farming or artistic performance or exhibition so it's it, okay. it, the English is bad but it's meant okay. to be a farming exhibition or an artistic performance and I, I, I could have wordsmithed that better but I'm not trying to talk about actual farming I'm still trying to talk about events okay so I guess I have a couple questions, and maybe the planning director can, can answer me. Um, so I know there are several farms in town that have, a, you know, a day where the kids can go and see the alpacas or, or the Stillman Fair at, the, mm -hmm. at Stillman's property or at the library there. They might have an art exhibition. Um, so how do those things currently happen? Well, the library... It's a library event. It's part of their... And sometimes they get a special permit through the selectmen for an event if well, they're having alcohol. I know yeah, they they'll, they'll get a, yeah, they might get a one-day pouring license. They may work with the selectmen to close down Memorial Drive. Mm -hmm. um, the Cultural Council has done that for their arts festival. Uh, those are municipal events on municipal property. Okay. So it's, it sort of fits in with the use of municipal property. Um, People inviting the public to your farm to visit the alpacas is mm -hmm. generally viewed as part of the agricultural exemption. It's you're using your farm as a farm and showing people farming. So it all ties back into what you're doing there. Um, Stillman's is a one day event. Um, they've been issued uh, licenses for one day beer and wine mm -hmm. and entertainment. Um, I think from a use perspective, um, a one-day event, and, and this was a question that came up two years ago with the initial uh, event on Holman Street that uh, has really sort of set off this whole process. <coughs> it was a one-time thing. It wasn't changing the permanent use of the property. The building inspector at the time felt it wasn't a zoning issue because they weren't at the time using the property in so much as a residence other than this large event that they were proposing. Um, Stillman's, I think, probably either falls within the agricultural exemption or you're not actually changing the use of the property doing this one thing. Uh, they, the, the, the country fair is um, loosely tied back to agriculture. There are many agricultural groups that, that participate as well as local craftsmen. Uh, so I, I think it's generally been viewed as you're not changing the use of the property and it falls within the general agricultural nature of the property. And that, that was... I'm, um, I am I am trying to find out in there are events in town correct and and I'm trying to understand how those events occur and what mm -hmm. differs them differentiates those from this so far the majority of events that that have happened mm -hmm. in the community in my time here have been municipal events tied to municipal property and municipal boards commissions 
uses departments. Stillman's was a little bit different. It was a uh, community event to start with uh, proposed by the Turkey Hill Lions, Lions Club. Club yeah. They did it in conjunction with the town. They started planning six months before their first one. They came to the town. They worked with the town boards and committees. And functionally, what there was no question about zoning raised at the time. Um, <clears throat> and I, we had a different building commissioner at the time. I believe that, you know, again, being a an agricultural use, the tone of it was agricultural to begin with and very much remains that today and i think it was tied back to that use so it's similar to uh, a car dealer having a you know a new car blowout and they bring in a food truck and you know they have a clown doing balloon animals to bring people in it's a let's celebrate our car through these other things that we don't maybe always have, but it's all focused on, here's our cars. We're selling cars at this car dealership. And Stillman's is a farm. They're trying to promote their farm and get people to come to the farm and recognize that they're there and partner with other agricultural purveyors. For me, I think a lot of it boils down to the fact that if you look at Stillman's, the fair is really an accessory to- Correct. The farm. The yes. farm exists 365 days a year. They are milking cows. They have a mm -hmm. retail outlet, and you can go there, you know, seven days a week and witness farming. And the fair is an extension of that on one day. Correct. Anything else? I've said my piece on this. I, um, I, again, this is a zoning article. It's not specific to any one person or any one property. This is town-wide. Uh, the 11,000 people in town, I'm sure that there are a good amount of people that like to recreate, to like to entertain. Um, this is not, again, specific. Um, that's why it's going to town meeting. Um, and it can be amended on the floor, I suppose, too, right? Yes, it can. So, and again, I I don't I don't want to have a floor fight with the board over this. We're here for a public hearing. If if there are concerns, such as one member has just expressed, I'd love to hear them either tonight or through the land use director, and present by motion something that this board is comfortable with uh, i don't i don't want to fight this board at town meeting are we required to make a recommendation at this time no you are required to make a recommendation prior to the town meeting vote okay so when it's presented at town meeting you you can defer and, and caucus at town meeting and make a recommendation if if that's what you wish to do Just looking at what do we have for options I guess my challenge with this is how does this differ from changing the use table so that you can have a function facility in all the residential districts? Because to me, this lines up best with function facilities. I mean, if you think about these type of events that, and you go through our existing use table, that's where I feel like this would land. Um, to to technically differentiate it, at least in my mind, that change, it would be a function facility and it would then be able to hold functions. In this case, it's still subject to the licensing authority of the Board of Selectmen uh, for events. So it's, in my mind, it's, it's not a, a function facility. It's still got that extra approval that's needed from the licensing authority oh theoretically uh, most function facilities would end up with a liquor license or i was something. gonna say a function facility i think is usually going to be m more uh, require like as as council said less um constant monitoring through a public process um but often Function facilities are buildings where 
the majority of what the events that are conducted happen within the walls of the building um, with some exterior space that's specifically designed for the handling of, of exterior functions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a function facility is a little more formalized and planned out. Um, this seems to allow or permit more ad hoc use of, of property as a uh, gathering place. And just one more thing, just to round out the information for the board, uh, the building commissioner's decision regarding this property has been appealed, and there is a ZBA appearing, a hearing, which I believe is scheduled for May 22nd. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen before town meeting, but uh, that determination is, is under appeal. Uh, we don't think that we're trying to run a business. The character is still primarily residential and the applicant would like to have a few events a year and we're desperately looking for the town either this board or the board of selectmen to tell us how many and that's that's where we're at thank you i, I will say I, I a previous speaker talked about limits and this is i do share the concern that that mr cole just talked about is how do you set the limit um, you know, could this be a thousand people? Could it be? I mean, so so I guess I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, but the fact that they do have to go before the board of selectmen, I think that could be a vetting process. But I am concerned about the lack of limitations on it. Certainly. You, you, you can't get away from the zoning protection aspect of this. You, you just cannot do it. Whether you, whether you give a license for a day, a week, a month, whether it's one event, six events, ten events, it's a precluded use. You cannot give a license for a use that is not allowed in that district. I'm very confident of my research. I appreciate that, but that has to do with Article 41, I believe. It if that's the case, and I, and I would question that, and perhaps we do need to consult with town council, because if that is the case, when we give one day licenses for such things as the art exhibits that have uh, wine, for example, at the library or Stillman's Fair, or in some circumstances, I know there had, at least when I was on the board, in one case there was a wedding that was in a residential area and they were granted a one day liquor license. So I, I would question whether or not that is in fact the case and I think we may want to talk with town council relative to that because I know for a fact that there have been licenses issued by the Board of Selectment for specific events at specific locations. Please step up to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Um, I know the events you're talking about, and those events are specifically condoned by statute. What, what differs those from, uh, from uh, an art exhibit, for example? There's there's a statute that governs the Liquor License Control Commission in, in, in Boston, and it specifically allows certain one-day licenses to be granted under under certain circumstances. That's that's a creature of statute. That's that's very different from, from what we're talking about here. I, I guess I'm confused because, it, you know, there have been events where there have been a band, for example, a live band and a one-day liquor license in a residential zone. How, how does that occur? That was illegal. I know what you're talking about. Well, that was two how, years ago. How, does, how is that How illegal? it happened is the Board of Selectmen granted the license and, you know, the neighborhood didn't appeal it. So the court was silent as to it. That doesn't mean it was proper. I think we need to talk with counsel. Well, in my understanding is that, say, the Board of Selectmen grants a one-day liquor license. That may give you the ability to have liquor on the premises for the one day, but it doesn't necessarily grant you the ability to actually have the event. <laughs> so one is zoning, the other is liquor. So, But I think at the end of the day, the discussion that is unfolding is what is the spirit of the bylaw like if somebody wants to have a wedding one weekend and friends and family are there and it's all private 
that to me is not a function facility but once you get to a certain point it's no longer an accessory to the primary use and i guess um, that's my question and i think that's what i would like information from council on i mean there are numerous times and i myself i might have a party and have a live band is that allowed is that not allowed um you know i know on the lake that i live on a lot of people do that is that prohibited if it's a private party um, so I'd like to understand what is allowed and what is not, because what I'm hearing are two differing opinions. Um, but it seems to me that if I want to have an event and I want to have a private event, is it, is it the differentiation between private and public? And, and how is that determined? Town Council did weigh in on this at the, uh, at the Board of Selectmen hearing. Town Council was there um, when the specific property and the specific two-year-old event was discussed. Um, they were the ones that clarified that zoning and licensing are two parallel, are two separate tracks. And to put a finer point on that, through the chair, what Council said is a license may be issued, but if the event is or the the use is not permitted by zoning the license may not be able to be acted upon so he said you could issue a license and if something isn't permitted by zoning it could be not permitted through through the the building official or through the the, the zoning process okay i didn't i did not take that away but he did, he did say it is too parallel he said the 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 fact that something may not be permitted by zoning or is is declared uh, prohibited by the zoning official wouldn't would be a reason that the board of selectmen could deny a license it doesn't require that they deny the license and the issuance of the license doesn't permit the event to happen if the zoning official has said that it's prohibited Can we get that in writing? I, I, I will. I'd, I'll like, I'd like to communicate talk with, with town council prior to town meeting about and this I, particular well, issue. And and to to that point, is that would that is that in reference to this article or in reference to general curiosity? It's in reference to this article. If we have to make a recommendation, mm -hmm. I'd like to understand the the facts and the law relative to this article. I'd also like to understand what is permitted by right on someone's property um i because that's that to me is the crux of this issue um and, and i want to understand that because there are and and, and i also want to understand why is municipal entities exempt and and are they exempt um you know so i i'd like to understand that when we had the bonfire and we have three bands playing is that okay is that not okay i mean it's a residential zone so, uh, you know, are, are we truly exempt? Um, and what exempts us versus a residential area? The zoning bylaw exempts Municipal. municipal uses as a general exemption. Okay, municipal uses, but is an event a municipal use? Yes. If a municipal, if a, if a municipal department or committee institutes an event, okay. it's a municipal use. The land is being used for municipal purposes. So the Cultural Council is an arm of the government of the town of Lunenburg. Okay. It's a, a chartered committee. Yeah. And so there, anything that they do is a municipal use in that sphere. They're producing this event, this art festival, mm -hmm. as a way to further their mission and goals as... So if a the municipal entity is sponsoring correct. it and the funds are being used for municipal correct. use. Correct. Okay. A new primary school. Okay. Residential zone school. Good. You couldn't build that building. I couldn't build that building. You no, could if you I, lived I, in I, it. I, I know As municipal a, use. Yeah. I know municipal use. I'm asking about specific events. I mean, I, I can so clarify that with town council, but that would be, mm -hmm. my experience would say that those things fall within the municipal use because it's happening on municipal property now if the cultural council went to tanner's house and said we're going to do this here 
then maybe you get into a grayer area because it's a residential property. It's not a municipal property, uh, but most municipal uses happen on municipal property and most events happen on municipal property. I mean, if you want to look at, um, you know, move away from the art festival and, and go to cruising night, that happens on Memorial Drive using the variety of municipal properties there. Same thing with the library events. So they're all connected. Right. We've, also, we've also had businesses on the lakefront have cruise nights. Sure. Um, and those are typically for a specific fundraiser mm -hmm. and licenses are granted to do that. Correct. Um, now, is that an add-on to their business? Not usually. Usually it's a fundraiser for a specific cause. Um, so I just want to understand mm -hmm. what differentiates using a private person from having a wedding at their property or having a party at their property what triggers the the uh, non-allowable use that's basically my question i don't think you're going to get a good answer for that I, and, and i'll tell you I, and i'll certainly pose the question i think the answer is going to be it's to be determined by the building official as to his interpretation or her interpretation of zoning, because that's ultimately how that all shakes out. I, I think that's right. I think, I think the issue is when does the underlying use of the property become something other than its zoned use? And in this case, we're talking about the primary use is residential. And the question, for the zoning official and now for the zoning board of appeals is when does the use exceed the primary allowed use and become something else we don't think seven events in the course of a calendar year is anywhere near that but i think i think that's exactly the answer it's not a permitting question it's a zoning question do we have an opinion from the zoning official that you can share with us uh, I can I can send it to you. I thought I thought it had gone out to you. Maybe it hadn't. I thought Marjorie had sent it out. Mr. Whitman. Yeah, I didn't. I did not bring it. I think <coughs> we're missing the point of this whole thing. All right. This is a residential zone. Having a wedding at your house okay, one time in 20 years or 10 years or whatever it is, is a whole different ball game than taking a business and running it out of a residential zone. Uh, Mr. Massey, in the past two years, I think uh, Chris Berilli and the uh, other people have uh, itemized it to the building inspector. There were 29 events the man had, okay? When he got turned down by the ZBA and he got the one, um, license from the selectmen and he couldn't get any more and the, the people showed up in force he went ahead and just did what he wanted to and this brings up another problem if this is approved who is going to monitor it you know like you say well we're going to limit it to you know 50 people at a time six times a year well, what happens at all the other times just like with mr massey what he did with the 29 events Okay, he advertised them on Facebook, he charged money for tickets. I mean, he, he, it was a business, and that's what it is. He's putting a business into a residential zone, and that is where the zoning comes into effect. You can't do it. You can't put a non-permitting use, a non-conforming use, into a zone without a special permit through the ZBA, okay, or changing the zoning through town meeting. And even then, okay, with all the abutters against it and so forth, like I told the board previously about, you know, court, uh, land, land law, okay, in court cases, a lot of case law on this where abutters have come out and spoken against it, against the uh, special permit, like we did with the ZBA and they turned them down. As well as, you know, the board here has a lot of influence at the town meeting with their recommendation. And that's why we're here, because you're, recommendation at the town meeting will be, it will be heard. 
and it will be considered heavily by the townspeople. And that's why it's so important that if we're going to have zoning in this town, let's keep the zoning. Let's keep the laws and protect the people. Where it's allowed in commercial zones or in agricultural zones, where the agricultural zoning actually has a lot of loopholes in it and a lot of leeway, okay, pertaining to the wetland bylaw and everything and creating ponds and so forth, agricultural land doesn't have to go through a lot of the permitting process. It was done that way so they could you know, continue their farming operation without hindrance. It was set up that way with the state. Other zones, if you wanted to fill wetlands or you know, alter them or whatever, well, you gotta go through the DEP, maybe the Army Corps of Engineers, maybe the Rivers Bill comes into effect, but under the agricultural zone, a lot of that gets pushed to the side. And that, that's the reason why it was done that way. And that's why we have zoning, to protect us. So I think we're really, we're trying to compare a wedding at somebody's house to this, it's apples and oranges. It's not even in the same ballpark. This is totally, totally different. This is saying, okay, it's okay. You can run your business maybe six, seven, eight times a year with multiple events and affect the neighbors with a license and circumvent the zoning, or we hold the zoning and say, no, it's not permitted in the zone. You can't run a business, period. That's the way it should be. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Steve Weaver, 288 Holman Street. Um, the the zoning is the key to it, and that's why it got put into that article, so that it could be a smokescreen for for doing all kinds of events in the future. The difference between a wedding, those are invitations. The events that are going out at 300 Holman Street are on Facebook. The Pride event was advertised in the Fitchburg Sentinel for 500 people. Mr. Bowen said that he would settle for 350. Well, the Board of Selectmen, when they did their approval, they made their motion for 250. So I still think that they're going to try to run 350 over there, which is a violation. So there's nobody that's monitoring it. There's no one that's holding the owner responsible for it. If something happens at that facility and somebody dies or something like that, that owner's going to be held responsible. He's not even a citizen of the United States. He could get on a plane and hop back to South Africa. And then is Lunenburg going to go chase him? No. It, it, there's, there's a whole bunch of things by um, that you're setting a precedent here by, by doing this and opening this up to zoning by passing this. So all I am asking you is to vote your conscience and, and, and try to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, please? Yeah. Yes. Hi, I'm Francisco Ventura, um, to Windermere Drive. New to the town, love it. If, if this board has a recommendation to the selectmen, it will, from my perspective, it will be to keep the neighborhood residential. If you can do that, do that for our families, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. 
I would like to wait till town meeting, and I would like to hear. If I want to see a copy of the letter from the zoning officer. I'd like to see any correspondence from town council. I want to do some of my own research. Um, so I'm not ready to make a recommendation. I agree. We need more information. Um, should we continue? Well, you can continue the hearing. You only have one more meeting before town meeting. You can close the hearing and make a motion that you'll defer and make a recommendation at town meeting. But if we're getting more information, I don't think we can close the hearing. Right. True. Well, I mean, you're going to get more information even at, at town meeting. Town Council can weigh in on our questions at a public hearing after we've closed it at town meeting. Well, and we can get information from the building official? I, I don't, it's I don't not, think I mean, I, that's, I, I'm fine with you continuing. I guess what I'm saying is, so you're going to continue until the 29th? If there's a motion. That is a motion. Um, I'll second that and then just have Discussion? one comment. Um, I mean, in my mind, it's pretty clear that we don't have a lot of answers to the questions that have come before us. And my thought process is we're, we really need to not only consider what's in front of us, but also all the unintended consequences of opening up a use in a residential area like this. Um, I mean, I think there's just, there's a lot to it in terms of if you were going to do this or draw the comparison, I'd say it's a function facility. That's the closest use I can think of. And, you know, if you're going to open up a true function facility in a commercial district, there's going to be full site plan review, parking spaces, fire suppression, board of health. And I feel my concern is in this situation, I feel like it would give any property owner in a residential district the ability to have commercial type events but not be subject to all of the oversight that you would get if you were doing this as a full-time commercial use um, and we talk about a lot of these other hypothetical situations like Stillman's Fair or any of the local farms they're subject to all of that oversight you know they have restrooms and parking lots and it may not be to the standard of a function facility but at least it's there um whereas but there in, isn't that same oversight i mean we don't have that oversight i share some of your concerns and i'm wondering it is a citizen position petition but because we have to make a recommendation i would like an opinion from town council on the potential as Tanner said, unintended consequences. I would like to understand the impact that this could potentially have on zoning, um, as well as I want some of the background information. So I want to just, because I've heard a lot that you want from town council, mm -hmm. and I want to be clear that we're getting the right information. I don't know that town council will necessarily give you a, a full accounting of the impact on zoning and unintended consequences, because that's... I just I'm not sure that that's what he'll do but so I'll I'll send the building commissioner's letter out in the morning mm -hmm. so what specifically but because I have you know our live bands permitted on a private so, property so at a private event questions. bottom line I have two questions okay what constitutes an allowable use on private property versus an unallowed use on private property? Is it the, the fact that one is a public event versus a private event? Is that what differentiates the use? Okay, hold on. And then the second question is... Hold on. Okay. So what constitutes an allowable use on private property? Is it the presence of public access? Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second? The second question is the potential impact that the passage of this article would have on zoning. I'm really just looking for an opinion from him on this article. Any more 
discussion. So there's a motion and a second? To continue, all, yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Continue to date certain, which is April. Two nine April. Okay. Yep. Thank you, folks. Thank you. So that's continued to your next meeting. Correct. Yes. Rob, which is next week? Yeah, next Friday. Uh, next, next Monday. Monday. Next Monday. Monday. The twenty ninth. Um. All right. So, what else do we have? We have. I would say that you should continue. Um, Based on his letter, it sounds like he's not going to come. Did okay. You, did you, well, did you hear his letter? I, I did read his letter. He says he's just going to do it at town meeting. And that's fine. So, I mean, you can do your public hearing and make your recommendation now. You can do your public hearing and defer to town meeting. This is on Hans on the... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it sounds like either way we're not going to hear from him. Not likely. Well, I mean, based on his letter, maybe I'm reading his letter, but he basically said he'll, he'll make the, he'll make the, um, I saw it in the pile somewhere, yeah. he'll, he'll make his presentation at town meeting. Well, he would need to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. But, so we can, we can caucus after he presents and Correct. come up with we just have to be careful. We can't really caucus because the Board of Selectmen used to do that, and we were told by town council you have to have the discussion in the public setting. You can't huddle and make a recommendation. That's what we were told. I mean, that's fine. You can, you can all stand to the microphone and have a discussion. Yeah. That, I say caucus. I mean, do right. it at, at meeting, not... Right. Well, I mean... Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, I, I, don't know. I, I think we've done a pretty good job in general with the solar stuff, and I know it's controversial at times, but I don't see any reason why this board would support an article to delegate what is currently our responsibility to another board. Nor do I. I agree. So I don't... Do we want to open the public hearing and take public comment? Yeah, I mean, you've opened the public hearing. Mm -hmm. So you could take. I, I mean, you'd have to take public comment as it. You'd have to at least offer it. So, so sorry, sorry to interrupt you, folks, but um, is there any public comment on the uh, the transfer of the approval authority uh, onto the solar review? So, solar energy systems, the ZBA would become the. Special, special permit, permit granting authority, authority rather than the planning board. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, so I would accept a motion. I would make a motion that we recommend disapproval of the article. Is that how we do it? Recommend disapproval? Yes. Or do Don't, not recommend approval? Do, do not recommend approval. Don't use it, Dave. It's not operational. Okay. <laughs> you as well. Thank you. You too. Did you second? Yeah. Yes. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um. Then you have 5.6 cluster bylaw just town council's anti-segmentation clause article F it looks like this so that's something we've already reviewed and Correct. it hasn't changed right did, no, did he not. make any changes we did not no I'd um, like to make a motion that we oh, support I would check for public comment uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll open it up for public comment. <laughs> Seeing none. <laughs> what article number is it? Um, Do we need to? No, I don't think so. You, just you, you, you can, I, I was going to say. Substantive changes, not substantive. I think it's, uh, it might be, it's before the citizen petitions, after the marijuana. 
33. Cluster development, 33, yes. I'd like to make a motion that we support Article 33. Second. Recommend approval. Recommend approval of Article 33. Okay. Just dotting our eyes. Second, yeah? Yep. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And now we need to do the marijuana article public hearings again. Now we've lost our audience. Is that a bad thing? Well, I, if we hadn't had such an extensive discussion of this at the last right. hearing, I mean, nothing has changed. Right. Uh, we had a procedural snafu in the office, so to make sure that we don't what run up it, against what it. What was the snafu? Uh, the letters are required to be mailed to the state, uh, notifying them of the public hearing, and I'm fairly certain that they were mailed, but we don't have a record of it. So in order to avoid uh, the Attorney General kicking the article uh, in review, we chose to rehear the, okay. the petitions. Okay. So I'll even do you the favor of reading the... Beautiful. Lunenburg Planning Board will hold a public hearing on April 22nd, 2019, 6.35 p.m., Joseph Bellotta Meeting Room, Town Hall, 17 Main Street, Lunenburg, Mass., 01462, to make alterations to the Code of the Town of Lunenburg, Mass., Chapter 250, Zoning, 1, Article 4, 4.1.G, Use Table, by adding non-medical marijuana uses, 2, adding 4.10 non-medical marijuana uses, Three, delete 4.15, temporary moratorium on sale and distribution of recreational marijuana. And five, create n a new 4.15 non-medical marijuana establishments. Copies are on file in the planning office, 960 Mass Ave, Lunenburg, Mass. Uh, so this is the final bylaw as approved by the planning board or the final bylaws, because there are technically seven of them, on March 4th. Uh, there have been no alterations other than those approved at the hearing on March 4th. Uh, as I explained, there was a procedural uh, snafu. Uh, there was a s couple of letters where uh, the record of their mailing was not in place. Uh, so rather than risk... Uh, Disapproval by the Attorney General. We're rehearing those this evening. Uh, again, this is the the what you have here, dated April 2, 2019, is the document referenced in the town meeting warrant and is on file in the town clerk's office, the board of selectmen office, and the planning office. Uh, it allows the marijuana uses in the zones where we spoke about them. All marijuana uses are allowed in the office park industrial. Cultivators would be allowed in RARB outlying. Marijuana retailer would be allowed in commercial and Summer Street overlay. And again, all uses would be permitted in the office park industrial. Again, offsets haven't changed. Language hasn't changed other than as approved in the minutes attached, which the board has already approved. Now we have public again. Is there any public comment? Thank you. Um, I would just like to uh, take uh, another opportunity to stress the importance of Article 25, which is the bylaw, um, to pass that such that uh, if any of these moratoriums or any of these um, um, Prohibition. prohibitions Prohibition. do not pass, that there is regulation in place other than that, I think we've talked about this quite a bit. I would make Indeed. a motion to recommend approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Okay, on that. Did we need to close the public hearing? You did hearing? need to close the public hearing. So go ahead and close it. It's closed. Well, I mean, we need a motion. But. Oh. Motion to close the public hearing. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Do we need to? On the subject of marijuana. Should we vote again? No, that's okay. fine. Um, I've got a short 
slide presentation because much of this is not easily translatable to graphics. Just doesn't make a lot of sense. We'll have handouts of the entire uh, bylaw at town meeting. Uh, and I'm kicking around the idea of, uh, I have one slide that shows a very simple um, flow chart of permitting a marijuana establishment, not in Lunenburg, just in the global scale within our bylaw, um, just to show what the steps are and who's responsible for what. Uh, I was pondering doing a outline that sort of details that with a little bit more information. I don't know if that muddies the water or if, uh, if that's something the board feels would be useful. Can you bring it to the next meeting? I mean, I can. I, I, I haven't started putting it together yet, but I, okay. can, I could probably put it together on Thursday and, and have it for Monday. Um, or at least distribute it to us? Yeah. Is there, is there something that the board something else the board feels would be helpful or two things in my opinion i mean i think having a slide of the chart i mm -hmm. mean people will have the handout but sometimes people don't pick up the handout sure. but having the zoning chart and the zoning map okay a slide of the zoning yep. map those are things that i think people are going to want to see mm -hmm. um Do you think it would be helpful to add the chart of setbacks as well, since you're talking about adding the chart or just the? Well, they're going to have. I think the, the setbacks, yeah. 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 They're not. They're not necessarily going to have the bylaw in their hand, are they? Well, the, they'll be. They'll be, they'll be on the, the handout table. They'll be handout. It'll so be the I, entire bylaw. I just bylaw, think when you're no, talking, I, I think it, those that's, are the that's a, It's a well. It, it's yeah. well taken. I. I. That's. This is what I'm looking for. Is yeah. do, you know. Um, I think from a presentation standpoint, I think our biggest challenge is going to be presenting it clearly so people mm -hmm. can understand, you know, like, for example, with the prohibition articles, they have to vote in favor Correct. to prohibit. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which, yeah, and, and I think it's more of a system and process. Well, and I do, ha I do have a slide. Uh, I don't want to say the most, most of my slides, but the... There's a number of slides on the prohibition and the fact that it's two-step and that passing it here doesn't mean that it passed for good. And so I, I've, that I've, I've kind of thought out and hopefully I explain things clearly enough. Um, and obviously we want to stress, as the chair just said, the importance of passing these regulations. Correct, and that, that I do have in the slides already. Super. No. We're not delivering it after we close the public hearing, are we? No, this is this is process for process town, for meeting. town meeting. Good. This doesn't have anything to do. You've already made your recommendations. Cool. All right. So that wraps up our public hearings for tonight. It does. Super. All right. Moving on to board discussions. Building reuse. This was put on at at. Um, Ms. Bertram's request. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure that it makes sense now, but I know that the selectmen have met with a number of various committees to get their viewpoint on building mm -hmm. use. And I think that the planning board should have had the opportunity to weigh in on those discussions since we were a member of the building. We had a member serving as a member of the uh, building reuse. And I think the reuse of these buildings is very much tied to town planning. Um, so I think that this is absolutely in our wheelhouse and I'm concerned that we haven't had that discussion. Um, I did, uh, as an individual, express that concern to the town manager. Um, you know, I think I, I'm not quite sure where the, where the board is at this point, um, but I'm very concerned that the planning board has not been a part of this discussion because I think it's something that absolutely affects what goes on. I mean, it's the center of our town. Right. Agreed. Indeed. I, and I think, And I think that it would make sense for us to send a memo to that effect. I mean, I, I would like to 
at least let them be aware officially that we'd like to have this discussion as the planning board, that any reuse of municipal buildings that affects the character and, and, and center of our community, the planning board should have a voice in that discussion. I would think so. So I would make a motion that we send a letter to the Board of Selectmen to that effect. Well, and I think at this point where town meeting's just around the corner, mm -hmm. this is probably a topic that we're going to take up after town meeting to see how things pan out. At if they pan out. Yeah, yeah, see how things come together. But I watched part of that discussion on the, their, the Selectmen articles and my recollection was I don't think they're supporting their own articles. I think they were split. Okay. And I, I, I don't know that I, they've had so many discussions on them. I, I mm -hmm. don't know that I was there when they voted, but I f feel like my sense has been it's, it's two members for and two members against, and which doesn't equal support, but I yeah. don't think is a, I think that mirrors what, sort of town meeting does and yep. you know, I think that there's been a lot of articles about these and they've often been relatively close yeah and just to echo what mrs. Bertram was talking to you know it is part of the planning board's charge to oversee the master plan and mm -hmm. these are all master plan components and mm -hmm. it you know speaking as a citizen I think the thing that's really missing from this whole discussion is what does the complete picture look like it's it's very easy to say well we want to take this one particular building and we want to sell it or we want to demo it or we want to repurpose it but without having clear answers to the people at town meeting floor as to what you're going to do with the other buildings and what that future looks like it's it's a tough sell in my mind mm -hmm. um you know, to stand at town meeting and say, well, we would like the right to convey this parcel. Okay, well, there's about a half a dozen questions that come to mind for me. One is, what are you going to get for it? I mean, if you ask me to support an article to convey a piece of land, I'd like to know what you're going to get for consideration for that parcel. Mm -hmm. um, if it's a dollar, I'm not in favor. <laughs> um, and essentially, that's the way these articles have been crafted. And um, so, I, I don't know. It's, I, it's a I tough sell. If, need... we, if we do receive the funding for the master plan, I absolutely think this is a discussion that needs to take place as to these are components we want in the master plan. And I think we do need to have a discussion with the Board of Selectmen. Well, I, I think the master plan components are statutory. I understand and, that, and but, I I, but specific to this, I think we want to include the municipal uses because it absolutely impa impacts the direction of the community going forward. Well, and I think that there's a thread throughout the entire master plan that, excuse me, that the these properties tie into. I mean, a component of them fits into the economic development section. A component fits into open space and recreation in so much as, you know, what do we do with them? How do they use? Gets tied into the government services and, and execution. It could get tied into housing, depending on what sort of tact it wants to take. I, I think the thing that we, in general, need to be cognizant of with the master plan is it's a, a living document that provides a shell of guidance in some direction for each of those things. And it's a multidisciplinary town-wide effort that the planning board shepherds, but everything that falls within the master plan isn't necessarily the purview of the planning board. Just creating the document and gathering that information is required to be overseen by the board. So I, I appreciate the, the the desire for the board to be involved in all those things and to um, contribute. And I think it's it's worthwhile and it informs everything that the board does from zoning to to all the, the nuts and bolts of, of regulation that, that we do. Uh, but I also think that there are elements that fall within the master plan that are outside of, of what the board would do from a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, and I think that as we develop the master plan, we just need to be cognizant of that. I, I'm certainly cognizant of that, but my, what I don't want to end up with is a master plan that has a bunch of recommendations in that we don't ever implement. Oh, I, I, and, I, I and agree. And when we look at and we look at the open space plan, and you look at the recommendations in the new open space plan, and you look at the recommendations of the old open space plan, mm -hmm. many of them are just carried forward because we haven't done that. So at some point from a planning perspective, when we end up with this document, mm -hmm. there has to be an entity that is their charge is to move forward with implementing these recommendations. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the document is basically useless. Correct. And, and, and many towns create master plan implementation committees. Mm -hmm. And they're made up of members of various town boards and some citizens at large and they meet maybe quarterly and and check in with people who've been working on or assigned different different factions of the master plan to move forward uh, and i think that your comment of once we start talking it we have to meet with the board of selectmen to talk about these buildings that's perfect because even if we haven't started the master plan and we've had that discussion once those things start to get woven into the master plan um, data analysis and recommendations it, it's not a surprise when these things are, are put out and someone says hey board of selectmen we've talked about this we've now assigned this as a, a recommendation or an objective within the master plan to meet this specific goal um, so I, I think that that all makes sense and I think I think we're coming at it from the same way I think we're just not saying the same things and mm -hmm. so we, we think we're, we're approaching it differently I just think that when we talk about building reuse and we talk about where a field is going to be or, mm -hmm. or where a farmer's market is going to be or wh what the what the you know what's going to happen with the building I, I don't know how you get away from the fact that that's planning well, um, if, if we had if we had jumped up and said that, well, we need this, we need that, we need something else in the master plan, and then they started talking about selling these buildings that we had presented that we would like to look at locating them, mm -hmm. then I can I can see a strong argument for what I think you're saying. But as as Adam was saying, that that conveyance and management of property is the board of selectmen, right? Yeah. So, but I just think it would have been nice. To have had the discussion. Yes, I, I don't that, disagree with that. Because I think that from yep. a planning perspective, and I think you and I actually were at the meeting, oh, yeah. uh, because we, we had been advised that there was a meeting, so both of us came, yep. and then I think we both actually talked. We did. Um, as citizens. So, you know, I just think that those are conversations that need to happen, and I think we need to have more of those. I certainly agree. We need more conversation. Okay. Okay. Um, so the next thing is something that I asked to be on there. Uh, again, another Board of Selectmen meeting it was uh, April 9th. Um, I was there. Um, I watched them unanimously vote to table the Economic Development Committee. Um, it's been being worked on since Adam got here. And um, I just, it, it was mentioned at that meeting that that actually is uh, another thing that's within the um, the master plan. Master plan. So, um, going with the suggestion that was made at the board of selectmen meeting, I think that the planning board should pick that back up and create it, like like the open space. At, at a minimum, I think that we need to go back to the work that MRPC done, whether it, whether it's relevant or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I think it would be great if that could be distributed to the board and we could at least review it and talk about it at a meeting and then figure out where we go from there. Because there was a great deal of work done and the discussions had started and unfortunately we had you know a, a traumatic event and the discussion ended, but at the time, it was the Board of Selectmen, the Planning Board, the Finance Committee, the Park Commission, all of the relevant boards were in that room to talk about this component and uh, something happened and it never got picked back up, we should at least look at it. Sure. So if we could put that on an agenda. Which information are you referring there, to? There's a master plan element. They did a chapter component. back they in early 2014. The yeah. What's in the chapter? It's a standard 
planning. It's a standard master plan chapter. Um, the recommendations are. I mean, I think we we look. Um, it was, was it looked housing at, or facility? No, it was, it was, it was, it was it's a all whole, it's a whole bunch of different things. Okay. Um, yeah, we we can do that, and and sort of to. You know, Matt's point: the it's in the master plan, but also. In two thousand seventeen, the town got a DLTA award from MRPC to do a, a business town partnership and a, a, maybe it was 2018 maybe it was just last year uh, and put together some recommendations on how to move that forward and the economic development committee was one of the recommendations contained within that as well um, to uh, you know work with existing business on retention and expansion and mm -hmm. needs of of the existing business community because that's a uh, it's an even bigger foundation of economic development than getting new businesses to come is if you have businesses how do you support them and how do you keep them viable and and thriving so matt are you at, are you suggesting that the planning board form an economic development committee yes um i would i would recommend that we do that after the elections and the reorganization and i think we should discuss it then right? and uh, you know i mean i guess my input to that would be uh, i think you have the power to do that you're an elected board you can create subcommittees as you wish um, but the board's going to have to give a charge to the economic development committee um, and so some thought from the membership on what you may wish to see the economic development committee do um, how you may want to see it composed all that stuff I think would be important to uh, put forward as you as you decide if you if you want to and as if you do decide you want to form the committee what are you going to charge them with and and who do you think should sit on that so as the chairman of the agricultural commission I was asked to um, put it on my agenda and get a representative from that group on this committee uh, so I'm I'm positive that that has already been done um, I would like all the work that's been done on it to to the April 9th meeting to be forwarded to us as well because it's already been mm -hmm. it's, it's already been documented and it's already been created what was the rationale behind the board of selectmen tabling it were they going to just table it till after the election they would or? no they withdrew their charge they withdrew the they had, they had issued a, they had created a, the economic development committee and and issued a a charge for them to to move forward with um, which I believe they did when when you may still have been on the board, yeah. um, and they just started populating it, and uh, it was brought up that why are we doing an economic development committee? Uh, I believe the discussion lended to we don't know if we actually want economic development. Uh, it was focusing on ecotourism and farming. There was question about why that was the focus of the economic development committee, and shouldn't we focus on other things? Uh, there was discussion of whether or not it was the selectmen's, uh, whether it was within their, their purview to do so or whether it should be the planning board because the planning board has economic development as part of the master plan. Um, and there was a lot of other side threads. And, and So in the spirit of discussion and trying to work together, which is I think what we, we absolutely need to do, does it make sense to have a joint meeting with the board of selectmen to discuss this issue, or or do you not want to do that? Well, and just to kind of pick up on what Mr. Bernie and Mrs. Bertram brought up, I think a we need to kind of define what the charge is and what we're going to focus on. But more importantly, I feel like we really need to make sure we're going to have the cooperation of any boards that are related to economic mm -hmm. development. Because I witnessed at one of the Board of Selectmen's meetings, they had an item on their agenda to grant temporary tax relief to a business that was located in town, did a massive expansion. And at the time that they were planning the expansion, the owner went through some health trouble. And so long story short, they ended up looking for the tax relief after they had already built out the structure and I don't recall specifically what the amount was but I want to say it was long the idea of you know two thousand dollars in tax relief 
and I that might have been quarterly. Yeah, um, I think it was about eight or ten thousand dollars a year total. Yeah. yeah, and they voted it down. And so, in my mind, if you're going to have a committee and propose economic development and try to foster growth in town of certain businesses, but you're not going to get the support of other boards through that process, it's going to make things a little difficult. Well, and I think so. that tax relief has to go through the board. It does. Select. It does. And so then you just need to have the discussion that says, you know, if, if we're looking to grow and grow our tax bases and help small businesses or any business in town, then you, you need the cooperation on the other end of things. And I think what's important from, from my perspective, having worked with economic development committees and other communities that uh, often are, are created by boards of selectmen, they're generally advisory boards and they're working with the business sector and the regulatory sector to identify efficiencies or detriments or barriers and make recommendations on ways that those deficiencies can be corrected, those barriers can be surmounted or lowered. Um, and generally, they're not going to be um, getting as granular as an individual business owner and tax relief. They may say the town should consider setting up a TIF program um, and here's what we think would be some reasonable parameters for TIFs, and here's what we think might be um, some thresholds that would allow people to qualify for TIFs, and then they would get taken on an individual basis. So I, mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying. I think that that was a, a unique situation that had a, a whole series of, uh, of misunderstandings, yeah, and, I, because it, it, and I was involved in that at one point, and it started with the state, and the 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 business owner went to the state and they have an office MOBD um, that does a lot of tax relief at the state level and works with local government and I, I think he got mired in that and mm -hmm. was like I just need to do this project and kind of went along with it hoping that he could do something with the town in the future and it all sort of just you know yeah. it was a wet paper bag and, of and I'm not trying marbles. to suggest that it you know, the Economic Development Committee go to the Board of Selectmen and basically say, hey, are you going to support anything yeah, we put no, in front no, of no. you? But yeah, I understand More that. or less just to get a feel for the situation to say, is this, any, is this something you would ever support mm -hmm. um, before you try to facilitate growth and then find yourself out in the cold? Mm -hmm. So, and what does, the, what kind of development do we want to see? as a community and you know the reality is maybe the development we want to see is what we have and maybe there are barriers that for one reason or another we're not being made aware of and a group that's looking specifically for those things may may be able to find them never mind expanding or growing i think looking at what was done i think in all the other master plans that have been developed, there have been visiting, visiting sessions, there's been public input. That, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot that goes into de, to defining a master plan. So it's not just the five of us that are gonna decide. No. Um, you know, so, but I think that a starting point is looking at what was done, what needs to be revisited, pulling, as Matt said, pulling up the information. If a charter was defined, mm -hmm. can we get a copy of that? Yeah. Um, you know, and let's put it on our agenda for discussion. And if we can formulate something, then forward it to them and say, well, we're happy to meet with you to discuss this, but this is what we're thinking. Sure. Sure. Exemplify the change we want to see. Exactly. I like that. Uh, so, do we have any further discussion on the Economic Development Committee? Okay. Um, minutes? Have I don't been... think I can approve them because I wasn't here for the whole time. So, I think the. Uh, Matt, uh, can wait. I... Yeah, I think we're better off waiting for Ken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just the one set? Yeah. It's amazing how short the agenda is when there's only one set of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, all right, committee reports. Um, capital planning has not met, uh, no report. Stormwater task force, um, we met, <laughs> we met to um, discuss the, uh, the, con the, um, <sighs> on words uh, we, we met with our with our consultants to discuss um, the their submission of a uh, contract for the next year and we touched upon a little bit of the, the data for the second year um, we decided to go with the people that we went with to get us to this point and um, there's discussion about having them go out to bid for the after the after this because we're, we're right up pretty much to it um, then um, discussion about um, future plans uh, what this task force turns into um, of the funding mechanism um, as this is an unfunded state mandate it, it's federal. Not federal and state um, we need to come up with the source and right now um, we're getting general funds in in the order of forty to sixty thousand dollars, hundred, hundred. Um, next year it's one hundred and ten in next year's budget. Oh, well, I think it was sixty in the um, this one. No, there was an additional sixty. Okay, there was fifty in the original budget, and then they they adjusted it to. Has there been 60. any talk about a stormwater fee? There has. There's been talk about an enterprise fund set mm -hmm. up. There's a, a stormwater utility. Mm -hmm. um, you know we're we're member to uh, this the Central Mass Stormwater Coalition. Yeah. Um, I believe is what thirty member group. Yeah, something like that. So it's about 30, 30 different towns in that group, and mm -hmm. it is the largest uh, that I know of. Um, so we get some support from them. Um, how would the stormwater fee work? You can do it a bunch of different ways. Um, a lot of communities do it based on the percentage of impervious material on a site. Well, um, but you form a stormwater yeah, utility. The, basically, what you do, you, you, utility is a misnomer a lot of times because you don't buy new equipment. So it's it's an enterprise fund that they call a utility. But you do buy new equipment. You you do, but it's you don't always. But but absolutely you can. I've you done can. a lot you, of research you, you, on yes, stormwater utilities. Yes, you can. Um, but because that's one of the biggest problems we have is we don't have all of the equipment to deal with some of the stormwater structures we have in this town. Correct. And many of the developments that have happened, and I've brought this up on numerous occasions, that, and I've actually gone to Jack historically and said, look, do you realize what's involved in taking care of this structure when, when they hand it over to the town? Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, if a stormwater utility is formed, you can implement, basically it's a tax, and a lot of utilities do it based on the percentages of impervious material on a site, and you implement a fee based on that square footage, and then with that revenue, you can then hire staff, you can buy equipment, you can Correct. basically you, become you an enterprise fund. And, and I say utility is a misnomer because people hear utility and they think that you're building a new building and you're hiring new staff and you're creating this thing where you have to buy a bunch of equipment. It's essentially an enterprise fund for care and custody of your the stormwater your system. Your existing infrastructure. And what, they, what you usually do, the base of it is you determine what an average residential unit is in town. So you say, on an average residential unit here in Lunenburg, you're going to have 2,800 square feet of impervious between the roof and the driveway and patio and all that. And you figure out what the fee for that is. And all resident, single family residents pay that fee. And then you do an impervious calculation for all more than, you know, two families would probably just pay a double fee. Mm -hmm. uh, three family and above. Institutional, commercial, you do a calculation for how much impervious they have. You divide it by the size of the rev equivalent residential community, round up to the next whole number, and then you multiply that by the residential fee. And so you figure out how many equivalent residential units there are in a commercial space, and that's the fee they pay. Yeah. So if, a, you know, if you say 3,000 square feet is the average house and you have a 12,000 square foot commercial facility, with impervious, they pay for residential fees. There's a whole and bunch of different ways. Yeah, there is, to do a, but that, that's, that, the, that's, that's the that's, most. That's the, the most, most common. used. That's and the most often common. the simplest. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then there's often a uh, an ability to get credits for adding uh, BMPs on site, and usually the credit mm -hmm. only knocks you down to about fifty percent because the the access to sites and everything throughout town benefits everybody. So you're always contributing to stormwater in some way because people use roads to get to and from your facility and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, like Ms. Bertram was saying, all of that money goes into the enterprise account for hiring of staff, purchasing of equipment, even contracting. I mean, some of these... Mapping, uh, so many different things. That some of these manholes she's talking about are, are vo you know, Vortechnic separators. They're proprietary. The water goes in and spins all yeah. the, the dirt out. And yeah. they require a vac truck, which is, you know, a three to four hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment that requires you know sixty thousand dollars worth of maintenance every year and you know if you have a dozen Vortechnic separators is that worth buying or is it worth hiring somebody who has one to go and clean those on a so it, it, there's a lot of operational things that go but into that, it but that fee structure basically gets applied to every every, every property every, every property, it, it, every it's property. not a tax so it applies to institutions, nonprofits, the school department, the town itself, right. the, the same as like sewer. So it's an uphill battle to get it approved. And, and a lot of communities, you know, several years ago, I was going to different seminars. A lot of communities do a lot of public up outreach in order to make people aware of what stormwater is costing, what the impact is, what the state law, law requirements are. Because mm -hmm. you have, obviously, in order to get it passed, you have to have town support. Um, but this is costing us all money, and it makes sense that, um, you know, the, the people that, the, the commercial properties that are generating a lot of the stormwater because of the amount of pavement are, are paying their fair share and not, you know, just single-family homeowners. But this is only going to cost us more moving forward. And the, the amount requirements of, are getting ridiculous, the just the testing of, requirements. The amount of work and, and equipment that's currently being devoted to stormwater in the DPW would be able to be shifted from general fund revenues to enterprise, to enterprise fund revenues. Fund. You know, street sweeping, catch basin cleaning, mm -hmm. um, system repair, all of that becomes into the enterprise account. So the DPW functionally has access to the same amount of funds, but there's now this chunk of general fund revenue that was, excuse me, assigned into their budget that may be open for reallocation in other ways that you know, pe people are still paying for that service through this other thing. Um, you know, I, we did, when I was at my previous, in my previous town, we went through this exercise and that was, you know, seven, eight years ago. And they were projecting uh, almost a million dollars a year uh, for the, the, the permit that, that we're under now. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a town of about 16,000 people and we were proposing a fee to get to a million dollars uh, of those 16,000 people of I, I want to say it was $85 a household mm -hmm. annually and our largest commercial use would have been a $10,000 fee and you know this was a it was a, a giant mall so it's not like it was one individual yeah. it was it was a property group that would be paying it but obviously you know they're making that back through their their rent structure um and so that was that was plugging in just over a million dollars into the the proposed enterprise fund um we had the misfortune of of proposing this on the, the tail of the recession so it kind of ha was colored by you know, we don't have money to do all these other things. Why would we want to do this? And they, they threw a carrot of, well, we'll give you a third of that out of the general fund. But that general fund revenue can get reallocated any time on town meeting floor, whereas an enterprise fee is locked in. And Now, do they make any sort of adjustments for the type of use? Like, nope. Okay. So I mean, it doesn't it's matter if you're it's based on uh, impervious, impervious okay. area. And, and you're, again, your BMPs and any, any stormwater controls would give you the ability to apply for uh, an abatement. But, mm -hmm. you know, then you have to come up with a process. And But I would really like us to talk about that at some point is that there is a lot in these developments, BMPs that could be implemented mm -hmm. that would really go a long way as far as stormwater. 
um, whether it be you know porous surfaces for porous driveways, whether it be um, you know there's all kinds of options out there for BMPs that would reduce stormwater and having the opportunity. There's no incentive right now, but if we could give credits, mm -hmm. that is the incentive. Well, um, since we are down to three members now. Um, so you would be more than welcome to show up and share some of your experience and expertise. I have folders and folders on stormwater. Let me tell you, it's probably this big. <laughs> so it's one of my big interests. So again, I would I would invite you to come, but um, you can share that information if you'd really rather not go. No, it depends on when it is. But yes, I am very interested. This this so. Thursday we're meeting. Okay. Uh, we typically meet on Thursdays. Um, Anyways, so that's it for stormwater. Uh, AGCOM, Agricultural Commission. Um, the uh, two meetings ago, um, our market manager resigned. And so at our last meeting, which was held last Thursday, um, we had two people step up to volunteer to uh, manage the market. Um, at the meeting, uh, they uh, decided that they could work together, so uh, now we have two approved market managers uh, for the upcoming farmer's market. Um, and that took up the majority of the meeting. So, And who are they? We have uh, Michael Fontaine, who was a uh, wild, well, he's a, he's a honey, se honey seller um, mm -hmm. from Lominster, mm -hmm. and uh, Shinina Fusara, who is um, a part of the Oak Tree Homestead, the mm -hmm. blacksmith on Oak Ave. Um, so we're looking forward to that. They, they came with a whole bunch of nice, good ideas, and um, we're looking forward to a successful season. And um, that's it, MJTC. Uh, the new tip is out. It's available on the website. MRPC. No meeting. Charter review. We are ready for town meeting. Are we you though? <laughs> we're as ready as are we're going to be. Really ever ready we had a meeting, meeting tentatively scheduled for the 24th, but that's been canceled because we're so ready. <laughs> uh, green communities. No, no update. Open space. No update since last meeting. Land acquisition. It is meeting Wednesday night. Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Well, we're meeting this Wednesday. I don't know that that's going to be our regular meeting, but we do have a meeting scheduled. Okay. Good. And that wraps that up. Uh, director's items. So we covered Economic Development Committee. Uh, town meeting, we just did all of our fun article business. So uh, we talked about my big questions on, on the, the presentation. Uh, traffic counts. It's that time of year again, folks. Um, so we're in year two of traffic counts. We get the ability to make requests for additional traffic counts. Um, if there are areas that the board feels would benefit from that. So which of the ones we're getting? Uh, we are Fort Pond Road, Lancaster Ave, north of Lemonster Shirley Road. Um, Fort Pond is south of Lemonster Shirley, which I thought kind of went without saying, but I'll say it. Uh, Lemonster Shirley east and west of Fort Pond. Lemonster Shirley east of Lancaster. Uh, Pioneer Drive south of Lemonster Shirley. And a turning movement count at Lemonster Shirley and Fort Pond. So I call this the South Lunenburg count year. Mm -hmm. I don't have any recommendations, but I would be curious to see if the police chief or the... They, they did receive do. this as well, and they, okay. they were you know requested to make any input that they might have okay um do we think that howard street might be a good place to get a traffic count why is there a concern holman. on howard street oh, oh holman no. street howard no he's no. talking about howard street howard street in light of our hearing next week oh okay yeah that yeah. might make sense uh at west townsend or new west townsend between the two mm. well it runs between the two but oh well, you know would you like it on they don't which do side intersection analysis they just do traffic well counts, they right? do turning movement counts if you ask but 
I, I guess what I'm saying is you have the opportunity to say, you know, east of or west of West Townsend or east of New West Townsend. And it would really be which direction do you think potentially might be impacted? I would think the majority of the traffic would be going to and from 13. So I would say the west of New West Townsend. Does that sound right? I think either way we get a fairly accurate number because there's nowhere you can go off of Howard other than New West Townsend and West Townsend. Mm -hmm. you, you can't. Correct. But I guess. you could come in one end and go back out that Co end. Yeah. And so. if you anticipate that the hearing is successful and that is granted then you have to decide are you concerned about additional traffic coming that way and what the impact is or are you just looking I mean, what what would be what would you be looking to get from the count i guess is the question because that determines where you want them to put it i think the west townsend end probably is more appropriate we west, have more roads west townsend yeah, I would yeah on that's that end that's what i right anticipated because, because that would be the the way the majority of people are going to be coming in mm -hmm. if you're going to two or or two a you're coming in from that end for them from most likely mm -hmm. um, and anyone traveling to or from points east would be coming in that way in most instances And if we add one, does that replace one of these? No. no we okay. can have up to four additional, and they potentially can accommodate it. You sneak. <sighs> That's what you should have told me. You should have told me, look at what you gave me when I asked. <laughs> No one at home has it, so. No, good point. We get to hear so my dulcet tones. We need to have the, the um, information to them by May 1st, so I would just check with the police chief. Yeah, I mean, I would send it in through the town manager and, and CC the police chief. and, and the I'm just, I, would, I would actually, you know, send them, send them some sort of contact and just mm -hmm. say, do you have any recommendations? Because anybody that's going to know, it would be those two. Police and fire, yeah. yeah. What about the OD Townsend Harbor Road? Don't do Townsend Harbor Road ever. Huh? Nope. Is it I can a north-south connector? Lot of it, it is a connector. I mean, I know it connects. I wasn't sure how how much people travel it to get. From oh, a lot. Do they? It's actually it's actually a federal aid eligible road um, because it connects two major routes, one nineteen mm -hmm. and two two A. But I don't know what we would do there. You know what I mean? I mean, mm -hmm. what would we gain? know how many people drive it yeah a lot <laughs> yeah I mean other than pavement management help which or not help just in terms of knowing how much traffic that gets I just travel that way quite a bit and it's pretty amazing to see how many people cut through there oh there's an incredible amount of traffic on that road it happens to be where I live so <laughs> Yeah, I would just defer to the police chief. I'm just looking at all the other roads in Townsend Harbor to me is very much like the Lancaster Ave and oh, I agree. Monster Road and I agree. Stuff. Yeah, I would I would just like Paul said, the police fire and, and also reach out to Jack to let him he's probably well aware, but Earth removal, I keep losing that, so I that will happen with with uh, solar and, and off street as we move forward after town meeting. 
uh, five, six we discussed, and that's what I've got for tonight. All right. Notice and communications. All scanned. All scanned. Meeting schedule. 29th, we've got the public hearing for Arrow Estates. Um, and now the public hearing for... Continued. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, do you want to meet on May 4th before town meeting, or do you just want to do town meeting? Well, if we get more information on April 29th, and we're still not satisfied we could have that extra 15 minutes to I mean, I can make it 8:30 if you want I'm not sure that we need the half hour but um, how do no one know? shows up at 8:30 when I schedule meeting <laughs> at 8:30 before town meeting so and then on the 13th you've got Powell coming back I think that we can probably handle, I mean, the only issue we have is the, is the petition article, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that hopefully we get the answers we want on the 29th, but if we don't, I don't know that we'll have any additional information before town meeting that we wouldn't have at town meeting, probably right? Probably not. Probably not. So I'm thinking we just go to town meeting. Well, if it's not there, we can't create it. If it is there, we can all skip it and leave just that skip and hang, it and just hold in the bag. Cancel it. Mm -hmm. That's all fine. Right, so eight, eight <laughs> I mean, we can post it and fine. just yep. never open it. That's yep. yeah. That's fine. Eight forty-five is fine. Wouldn't be the first time. All right. So then, ongoing items. Um, we'll kick off with parking and solar as we. Fill out the board. Economic development, I think we've talked about, and same thing with master planning. We need some cash before. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Got a line for public comment, though. Yeah. Right. So, is there any public comment? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, um, any board comments or concerns? Can I just get a copy of the zoning map? My protective yeah. bylaw doesn't have one. Oh, it doesn't? No. Sure. We're going to get new, um, by, new bylaws you know after what? the meeting, right? Let's, uh, uh, no, I'll say, I, I mean, I can, I can print you one. It'll that be 11 be, by 17. That would be great. And then everyone will get a new one if everything passes at town yeah. meeting. Yeah. yeah. That would be great. All right. Well, motion to adjourn. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 You can't leave. Thank you very no, much. No, we're going to sign stuff. Sign your lives away.